Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 558, An Unequal Mix of Good and Bad. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. We had a great time last night. I got there late for our Thursday night Zoom chat. Please remember, you are more than welcome to pop in, join in. Last night, because I didn't have my screen set right, I didn't even notice we had a brand new person whose name I think was Elizabeth, and I'm so sorry that I didn't see you and ask you what you were reading, and my bad. So come again, please. Today, I have several things for you. The first is a pandemic study. One of the contact tracers at work is a neighbor of a college professor. He's an online, he works at an online college like many people are doing these days. And I have a a link to his bio, but I also have a link to a pandemic study that is a volunteer study. They are running it off of a Google form. There's a whole disclaimer on the first page to read that just says it's a volunteer study. And by doing this, you're volunteering. They are collecting exactly zero data about you, name, address, phone number, stuff like that. So as far as that goes, it's anonymous. Yeah, if you're interested, they're basically looking to get kind of a baseline idea uh, framework for how people have been coping with the pandemic. What are the things that they've been most worried about? That kind of stuff. It took me about five minutes to take the whole thing. So you know these studies are always better with more people and more information. So if you have time in the show notes, go ahead and click on the pandemic study link and give them your two cents. Another person at work shared the, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Antikythera, Antikythera. I don't even know which emphasis to put on which syllable. It's a Greek island. And there was this Antikythera mechanism. It's a mechanism that they found in a shipwreck that was submerged. It's thousands of years old. And it did really cool, weird things like it calculated eclipses and I think leap years and all sorts of stuff. It's a gear-based calculator. I don't understand. (laughs) The whole thing, not surprisingly, I think it had been made of brass originally, being in the ocean for a very long time, it was all corroded and bleh. And by using really cool x-ray technology, they were able to figure out what the gears were, what how the mechanism worked. And, and they're like steps and steps. It's been a process getting steps and steps closer to being able to recreate one. So yeah, it's wild. So I have linked out to an article and also a video. So if your kids are interested in weird stuff like sunken treasure, this would be definitely something I would send or show or share with them. Also, mom, you have to skip ahead for about two minutes. Okay, I'm going to wait so that you can skip ahead for about two minutes. Okay, so I have two minutes to share this with you. Last night, I was talking about the fact that I have these old antique teacups that I had collected in my early 20s, and I was just going to have to divest myself of them. That being said, Tracy, who is a goddess, said, oh, instead of getting rid of them, why don't you turn them into teacup candles? To which I said, good God, woman, where have you been all my life? You're a genius. Thank you. So I am linking out to a whole mess load of both videos and how to's. Each one has a little more or a little slightly different information on how to, and I highly suggest taking a look at all of the articles, like just skim through them because I didn't find one compendium of best practices for this, but all of this put together, I think gives you a pretty clear picture. Totally going to do that. Hello, birthday and Christmas presents. Thank you, Tracy. 
Did I do it in under two minutes? I think I did. Okay. So mom can start listening at any time now, (laughs) which I know if she's skipped ahead too far, she wouldn't hear me say that, but that's okay. The last thing I'm going to share with you guys is giant dog pictures. I haven't giggled like this for a while. Uh, One of my friends here, part of my mom's squad, paid a guy on who's on Instagram. You can see a bunch of his work on Instagram. He's really, really good on Photoshop, and he's really meticulous with his ability to cut images from one picture and insert those images in clever, very clever ways into another picture. So what he does is if you send him a really good picture of your dog and a full body picture of you or your family or friends, he will combine the picture of your dog and the human. And it's great. And then he, when he sends it to you, he sends it to you with the, you now own this. Here's the high definition image. So he retains no rights to the image once you've purchased it and he sent it to you. I've got a link out to his Instagram feed. If you need a smile, please do take a look. And if you're interested, his instructions for how to get one of these done for yourself are embedded in his Instagram feed. But the upshot from what I understood was you email him directly. His email is there. Make sure he's on deck to do it. You know that he's, he's got time, that he's not backed up. And then I think he uses PayPal. You send him money and the photographs, he sends you your picture, like within 48 hours or something ridiculous. Because my friend had it done and it seemed like she told me about it one day and two days later she sent me the picture, which is hilarious. So yeah, if you're looking for something very different for gifts, highly recommended. I am totally going to take advantage of this. I'm sitting here thinking, Does it have to be a dog? Could it be a cat? I actually don't know. You'd need to email him. I haven't seen any pictures of cats. He has dogs. So I haven't seen any pictures of him with cats on his Instagram. But he's just moved within the last, I think, year and a half. He moved from the upper Midwest to North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, somewhere like that. So it's been a big transition during a really weird time. And so he he hasn't been able to go out and you know, show his stuff at craft fairs or at farmer's markets. So I think he's had a hard time kind of drumming up business in his new location. So I thought I'd share his information with you. And, uh, and if you're interested, please, please uh, contact him and then send me a picture or tag me on Instagram or something. Cause I want to see what you did <laughs> because again, it's a giggle. And now our book. Two chapters that I thought were kind of meh, you know, they move the plot along. I don't know why I thought they were meh the first time I went through the book. I did. I was a fool. Interesting things happen. Interesting Henry things happen in today's chapters. There are a few references to old things that we, at least in the States, don't talk about very much. One is you'll hear a reference to a dimity bed, D-I-M-I-T-Y. I remembered this word, dimity, from my ancient past. I could not remember what it was and had to look it up. A dimity bed is basically a bed that has a dimity comforter or bedspread or counterpane on it. It's a sturdy cotton. The pattern is woven in. It's very nice. It also was very popular before Jane Austen finished writing this book. And that goes along with another thing that was popular slash in use before Jane Austen wrote this book. And it's significant for a reason, which I will fill you in on on the flip side. The second thing that was popular before is a bath stove. So I wasn't clear on the bath part, but the stove part is It's a a metal grate that was put in front of a fireplace, sometimes called a hob grate, H-O-B. And I've heard that reference before too. I never thought to look it up before. It was another way of making radiant heat for a room. It was better than a regular old fireplace, but it wasn't as good as the Rumsford stove, which was more 
currently popular when Jane Austen wrote this book. All right, so that's important to know. You'll hear a reference to a bilious fever. Bilious goes back to an idea of the humors. Bilious fevers were things like cholera or typhoid, digestive, unpleasant things that you could die from. So that would have been unfortunate. I know we've talked about this in the past. I'm bringing it up again because it's one of those things that I often forget that the terminology wasn't general. It was specific. If somebody is sick and a physician is called, a physician is the person who had actual medical training. He probably at this point was um, going to Edinburgh for medical training or to the continent, the European continent. Physicians being trained professionals were more expensive than a doctor. And I even think probably more expensive than a surgeon because I think surgery was not, it seems weird, as well trained for as being a physician. So a physician coming to a slightly remote location to check on a patient would have cost some major bucks. A baronet. A baronet is below a lord, but above a knight. So it's the first title that comes with it, the requirement that you be referred to as sir and your wife would be referred to as lady. Unlike a knight, where the sir and the lady thing is true, the sir and the knightness doesn't get passed on to your children. Being a baronet, that does get, the title does get passed on to your children. So that would be like the lowest layer of that whole class structure with knights and nobility and royalty and all of that. Just so you know, baronet, below a lord, above a knight, hereditary title. You will hear the term Japan again used as a lowercase term. This goes back to what we talked about a couple episodes ago with Japanning, which was the art process by which you would black lacquer uh, cabinetry and uh, some other kinds of furniture, but often it was cabinetry or boxes, things like that got Japanned. So not liking Japan is really not liking Japanning, which is really not liking the way that furniture is decorated. It has nothing to do with the not liking the country itself. Something I don't remember having come across before. Looking at a letter to see who it's from, there usually weren't any return addresses on letters. These were still just large-ish pieces of paper that were folded several million times <laughs> and then had uh, sealing wax put on to close it. And then an address was written on the outside. Now we talk about it as an address. They talked about it as an address too sometimes, but they also talked about it as the direction. So you would look at a letter's direction and if you recognized the handwriting, you could tell who it was from no need to have a return address. So if somebody checks the direction on a letter, they're actually looking at the to at this location direction and just checking out the handwriting. We have one more professional difference, attorney versus lawyer. And I, I know we've dealt with this before, certainly in Bleak House. For those of you who listened to, to Bleak House when we were doing the premium feed, talking horn. But here's the short version of what you need to know. An attorney would not have had any formal legal education. So they would be kind of like paralegals now who I know actually do have legal education, but they would have performed the same kind of function, maybe a step up from a paralegal. They would have been dealing with paper, mostly. Things that didn't require you going to court. A barrister would have had a formal education and because of that would be considered a gentleman. So an attorney was just a guy who did legal paperwork-ish and the barrister totally enters into the classed world of things and is considered a gentleman. However, if in a book at this time someone is referred to as, oh, I think that person was a lawyer, it could be either an attorney or a barrister. And so further questions would be required to determine if the person we're talking about 
is a gentleman or not. So there's a whole lot of implied context going on in a conversation that follows the phrase, oh, I think he was a lawyer. All right, that's it. Let's listen to chapters 24 and 25. Or if you are in a two-volume book and reading along with us, that would be volume two, chapters nine and 10 of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by the fabulous Mandegar. Here we go. Chapter 24. The next day afforded no opportunity for the proposed examinations of the mysterious apartments. It was Sunday, and the whole time between morning and afternoon service was required by the general in exercise abroad or eating cold meat at home, and great as was Catherine's curiosity, her courage was not equal to a wish of exploring them after dinner, either by the fading light of the sky between six and seven o'clock, or by the yet more partial though stronger illumination of the treacherous lamp. The day was unmarked, therefore, by anything to interest her imagination, beyond the sight of a very elegant monument to the memory of Mrs Tilney, which immediately fronted the family pew. By that, her eye was instantly caught and long retained, and the perusal of the highly strained epitaph, in which every virtue was ascribed to her by the inconsolable husband, who must have been in some way or other her destroyer, affected her even to tears. That the general, having erected such a monument, should be able to face it, was perhaps not very strange, and yet that he could sit so boldly collected within its view, maintain so elevated an air, look so fearlessly around, nay, that he should even enter the church, seemed wonderful to Catherine. Not, however, that many instances of being equally hardened in guilt might not be produced, she could remember dozens who had persevered in every possible vice, going on from crime to crime, murdering whomsoever they chose without any feeling of humanity or remorse, till a violent death or a religious retirement closed their black career. The erection of the monument itself could not in the smallest degree affect her doubts of Mrs Tilney's actual decease. Were she even to descend into the family vault where her ashes were supposed to slumber, were she to behold the coffin in which they were said to be enclosed, what could it avail in such a case? Catherine had read too much not to be perfectly aware of the ease with which a waxen figure might be introduced and a supposititious funeral carried on. The succeeding morning promised something better. The general's early walk, ill-timed as it was in every other view, was favourable here, and when she knew him to be out of the house, she directly proposed to Miss Tilney the accomplishment of her promise. Eleanor was ready to oblige her, and Catherine, reminding her as they went of another promise, their first visit, in consequence, was to the portrait in her bedchamber. It represented a very lovely woman, with a mild and pensive countenance, justifying so far the expectations of its new observer. But they were not in every respect answered, for Catherine had depended upon meeting with features, air, complexion, that should be the very counterpart, the very image, if not of Henry's, of Eleanor's, the only portraits of which she had been in the habit of thinking bearing always an equal resemblance of mother and child. A face, once taken, was taken for generations. But here she was obliged to look and consider, and study for a likeness. She contemplated it, however, in spite of this drawback, with much emotion, and, but for yet stronger interest, would have left it unwillingly. Her agitation as they entered the great gallery was too much for any endeavour at discourse. She could only look at her companion. Eleanor's countenance was dejected, yet sedate, and its composure spoke her, inured to all the gloomy objects to which they were advancing. Again she passed through the folding doors, again her hand was upon the important lock, and Catherine, hardly able to breathe, was turning to close the former with fearful caution, when the figure, the dreaded figure of the general himself at the further end of the gallery, stood before her. The name of Eleanor, at the same moment in his loudest tone, resounding through the building, giving to his daughter the first information of his presence, and to Catherine terror upon terror. An attempt at concealment had been her first instinctive movement upon perceiving him, yet she could scarcely hope to have escaped his eye, and when her friend, who with an apologising look darted hastily by her, had joined and disappeared with him, 
She ran for safety to her own room, and locking herself in, believed that she should never have the courage to go down again. She remained there at least an hour, in the greatest agitation, deeply commiserating the state of her poor friend, and expecting a summons herself from the angry general to attend him in his own apartment. No summons, however, arrived, and at last, on seeing a carriage drive up to the abbey, she was emboldened to descend and meet him under the protection of visitors. The breakfast room was gay with company, and she was named to them by the general as the friend of his daughter, in a complimentary style which so well concealed his resentful ire as to make her feel secure at least of life for the present. And Eleanor, with a command of countenance which did honour to her concern for his character, taking an early occasion of saying to her, "'My father only wanted me to answer a note,' she began to hope that she had either been unseen by the general, or that for some consideration of policy she should be allowed to suppose herself so. Upon this trust she dared still to remain in his present after the company left them, and nothing occurred to disturb it. In the course of this morning's reflections she came to a resolution of making her next attempt on the forbidden door alone. It would be much better in every respect that Eleanor should know nothing of the matter. To involve her in the danger of a second detection, to court her into an apartment which must wring her heart, could not be the office of a friend. The general's utmost anger could not be to herself what it might be to a daughter, and besides, she thought the examination itself would be more satisfactory if made without any companion. It would be impossible to explain to Eleanor the suspicions from which the other had in all likelihood been hitherto happily exempt. Nor could she therefore in her presence search for those proofs of the general's cruelty, which however they might yet have escaped discovery, she felt confident of somewhere drawing forth, in the shape of some fragmented journal, continued to the last gasp. Of the way to the apartment she was now perfectly mistress, and as she wished to get it over before Henry's return, who was expected on the morrow, there was no time to be lost. The day was bright, her courage high. At four o'clock the sun was now two hours above the horizon, and it would be only her retiring to dress half an hour earlier than usual. It was done, and Catherine found herself alone in the gallery before the clocks had ceased to strike. It was no time for thought. She hurried on, slipped with the least possible noise through the folding doors, and without stopping to look or breathe, rushed forward to the one in question. The lock yielded to her hand, and luckily with no sullen sound that could alarm a human being. On tiptoe she entered. The room was before her, but it was some minutes before she could advance another step. She beheld what fixed her to the spot, and agitated every feature. She saw a large, well-proportioned apartment, a handsome dimity bed, arranged as unoccupied with a housemaid's care, a bright bath stove, mahogany wardrobes and neatly painted chairs, on which the warm beams of a western sun gaily poured through two sash windows. Catherine had expected to have her feelings worked, and worked they were. Astonishment and doubt first seized them, and a shortly succeeding ray of common sense added some bitter emotions of shame. She could not be mistaken as to the room, but how grossly mistaken in everything else, in Miss Tilney's meaning, in her own calculation. This apartment, to which he had given a date so ancient, a position so awful, proved to be one end of what the general's father had built. There were two other doors in the chamber, leading probably into dressing closets, but she had no inclination to open either. Would the veil in which Mrs Tilney had last walked, or the volume in which she had last read, remain to tell what nothing else was allowed to whisper? No, whatever might have been the general's crimes, he had certainly too much wit to let them sue for detection. She was sick of exploring, and desired but to be safe in her own room, with her own heart only privy to its folly and she was on the point of retreating as softly as she had entered, when the sound of footsteps, she could hardly tell where, made her pause and tremble. To be found there, even by a servant, would be unpleasant, but by the general, and he seemed always at hand when least wanted, much worse. She listened, the sound had ceased, and resolving not to lose a moment, she passed through and closed the door. At that instant, door underneath was hastily opened, Someone seemed with swift steps to ascend the stairs, 
by the head of which she had yet to pass before she could gain the gallery. She had no power to move. With a feeling of terror not very definable, she fixed her eyes on the staircase, and in a few moments it gave Henry to her view. "'Mr. Tilney!' she exclaimed in a voice of more than common astonishment. He looked astonished too. "'Good God!' she continued, not attending to his address. "'How came you here? How came you up that staircase?' "'How came I up that staircase?' he replied, greatly surprised. "'Because it's my nearest way from the stable-yard to my chamber. Why should I not come up it?' Catherine recollected herself, blushed deeply, and could say no more. He seemed to be looking at her countenance for that explanation which her lips did not afford. She moved on towards the gallery. "'May I not ask in my turn?' said he, as he pushed back the folding doors. "'Ask how you came here?' This passage is at least as extraordinary a road from the breakfast parlour to your apartment as that staircase can be from the stable to mine. I have been, said Catherine, looking down, to see your mother's room. My mother's room? Is there anything extraordinary to be seen there? No, nothing at all. I thought you did not mean to come back till tomorrow. I did not expect to be able to return sooner. When I went away, but three hours ago, I had the pleasure of finding nothing to detain me. You look pale. I'm afraid I alarmed you by running so fast up those stairs. Perhaps you did not know. You were not aware of their leading from the offices in common use. No, I was not. You've had a very fine day for your ride. Very. And does Eleanor leave you to find your way in all the rooms in the house by yourself? Oh, no, she showed me over the greatest part on Saturday, and we were coming here to these rooms, but only... Dropping her voice, your father was with us. And that prevented you said Henry, earnestly regarding her. Have you looked into all the rooms in that passage? No, I only wanted to see. Is it not very late? I must go and dress. It's only quarter past four, showing his watch. And you're not now in Bath. No theatre, no rooms to prepare for. Half an hour at Northanger must be enough. She could not contradict it, and therefore suffered herself to be detained, though her dread of further question made her, for the first time in their acquaintance, wish to leave him. They walked slowly up the gallery. "'Have you had any letter from Bath since I saw you?' "'No, and I'm very much surprised. Isabella promised so faithfully to write directly.' "'Promised so faithfully. Faithful promise. That puzzles me. I have heard of a faithful performance, but a faithful promise. The fidelity of promising. It is a power little worth knowing, however, since it can deceive and pain you.' My mother's room is very commodious, is it not? Large and cheerful looking, and the dressing closet so well disposed. It always strikes me as the most comfortable apartment in the house, and I rather wonder that Eleanor should not take it for her own. She sent you to look at it, I suppose? No. It has been your own doing entirely. Catherine said nothing. After a short silence, during which he closely observed her, he added, as there's nothing in the room in itself to raise curiosity, this must have proceeded from a sentiment of respect for my mother's character, as described by Eleanor, which does honour to her memory. The world, I believe, never saw a better woman, but it is not often that virtue can boast an interest such as this. The domestic, unpretending merits of a person never known do not often create that kind of fervent, venerating tenderness which would prompt a visit like yours. Eleanor, I suppose, has talked of her a great deal. Yes, a great deal. That is, no, not much. But what she did say was very interesting. Her dying so suddenly. Slowly and with hesitation as it was spoken. A and you, none of you being at home, and, and your father, I thought perhaps had not been very fond of her. And from these circumstances, he replied, his quick eye fixed on hers, you infer, perhaps, the probability of some negligence, some, involuntarily, she shook her head, or it may be of something still less pardonable. She raised her eyes towards him more fully than she had ever done before. My mother's illness, he continued, the seizure which ended in her death was sudden, the malady itself one from which she had often suffered, a bilious fever, its cause therefore constitutional, on the third day, in short, as soon as she could be prevailed on, a physician attended her, a very respectable man, and one in whom she had always placed great confidence. 
Upon his opinion of her danger, two others were called in the next day and remained in almost constant attendance for four and twenty hours. On the fifth day she died. During the progress of her disorder, Frederick and I, we were both at home, saw her repeatedly, and from our own observations can bear witness to her having received every possible attention which could spring from the affection of those about her, or which her situation in life could command. Poor Eleanor was absent, and at such a distance as to return only to see her mother in her coffin. "'But your father,' said Catherine, "'was he afflicted?' For a time, greatly so. You have erred in supposing him not attached to her. He loved her, I am persuaded, as well as it was possible for him to. We have not all, you know, the same tenderness of disposition, and I will not pretend to say that while she lived she might not often have had much to bear. But though his temper injured her, his judgment never did. His value of her was sincere, and if not permanent, he was truly afflicted by her death. I am very glad of it, said Catherine. It would have been very shocking. If I understand you rightly, you had formed a surmise of such horror as I have hardly words to. Dear Miss Morland, consider the dreadful nature of the suspicions you have entertained. What have you been judging from? Remember the country and the age in which we live. Remember that we are English, we are Christians. Consult your own understanding, your own sense of the probable, your own observation of what's passing around you. Does our education prepare us for such atrocities? Do our laws connive at them? Could they be perpetrated without being known in a country like this, where social and literary intercourse is on such a footing, where every man is surrounded by a neighbourhood of voluntary spies, and where roads and newspapers lay everything open? Dearest Miss Morland, what ideas have you been admitting? They had reached the end of the gallery, and with tears of shame she ran off to her own room. Chapter 25 The visions of romance were over. Catherine was completely awakened. Henry's address, short as it had been, had more thoroughly opened her eyes to the extravagance of her late fancies than all their several disappointments had done. Most grievously was she humbled. Most bitterly did she cry. It was not only with herself that she was sunk, but with Henry. Her folly, which now seemed even criminal, was all exposed to him— and he must despise her for ever. The liberty which her imagination had dared to take with the character of his father, could he ever forgive it? The absurdity of her curiosity and her fears, could they ever be forgotten? She hated herself more than she could express. He had, she thought he had, once or twice before this fatal morning, shown something like affection for her. But now, in short, she made herself as miserable as possible for about half an hour, went down when the clock struck five with a broken heart and could scarcely give an intelligible answer to Eleanor's inquiry if she was well. The formidable Henry soon followed her into the room and the only difference in his behaviour to her was that he paid her rather more attention than usual. Catherine had never wanted comfort more and he looked as if he were aware of it. The evening wore away with no abatement of this soothing politeness and her spirits were gradually raised to a modest tranquillity. She did not learn either to forget or defend the past, but she learned to hope that it would never transpire further, and that it might not cost her Henry's entire regard. Her thoughts being still chiefly fixed on what she had with such causeless terror felt and done, nothing could shortly be clearer than it had all been a voluntary self-created delusion, each trifling circumstance receiving importance from an imagination resolved on alarm, and everything forced to bend to one purpose by a mind which, before she entered the abbey, had been craving to be frightened. She remembered with what feeling she had prepared for a knowledge of Northanger. She saw that the infatuation had been created, the mischief settled long before her quitting Bath, and it seemed as if the whole might be traced to the influence of that sort of reading which she had there indulged. Charming as were all Mrs. Radcliffe's works, and charming even as were the works of all her imitators, it was not in them perhaps the human nature, at least in the Midland counties of England, was to be looked for. Of the Alps and the Pyrenees, with their pine forests and their vices, they might give a faithful delineation, and Italy, Switzerland and the south of France might be as fruitful in horrors as they were there represented. 
Catherine dared not doubt beyond her own country, as even of that, if hard-pressed, would have yielded the northern and western extremities. But in the central part of England there was surely some security for the existence even of a wife not beloved, in the laws of the land and the manners of the age. Murder was not tolerated, servants were not slaves, and neither poison nor sleeping potions to be procured like rhubarb from every druggist. Among the Alps and Pyrenees, perhaps, there was no mixed characters. There, such as were not as spotless as an angel, might have the dispositions of a fiend. But in England it was not so. Among the English, she believed, in their hearts and habits, there was a general, though unequal, mixture of good and bad. Upon this conviction, she would not be surprised if even in Henry and Eleanor Tilney some slight imperfection might hereafter appear— and upon this conviction she need not fear to acknowledge some actual specks in the character of their father, who, though cleared from the grossly injurious suspicions which she must ever blush to have entertained, she did believe, upon serious consideration, to be not perfectly amiable. Her mind made up upon these several points, and her resolution formed of always judging and acting in future with the greatest good sense, she had nothing to do but to forgive herself and be happier than ever— and the lenient hand of time did much for her by insensible graduations in the course of another day. Henry's astonishing generosity and nobleness of conduct, in never alluding in the slightest way to what had passed, was of the greatest assistance to her, and sooner than she could have supposed it possible in the beginning of her distress, her spirits became absolutely comfortable and capable, as heretofore, of continual improvement by anything he said. There were still some subjects, indeed, under which she believed they must always tremble, the mention of a chest or a cabinet, for instance, and she did not love the sight of Japan in any shape. But even she could allow that an occasional memento of past folly, however painful, might not be without use. The anxieties of common life began soon to succeed to the alarms of romance. Her desire of hearing from Isabella grew every day greater— she was quite impatient to know how the bath world went on, and how the rooms were attended, and especially was she anxious to be assured of Isabella's having matched some fine netting cotton on which she had left her intent, and of her continuing on the best terms with James. Her only dependence for information of any kind was on Isabella. James had protested against writing to her till his return to Oxford, and Mrs. Allen had given her no hopes of a letter till she got back to Fullerton. But Isabella had promised and promised again, and when she promised a thing she was so scrupulous in performing it. This made it so particularly strange. For nine successive mornings Catherine wandered over the repetition of a disappointment which each morning became more severe. But on the tenth, when she entered the breakfast room, her first object was a letter held out by Henry's willing hand. She thanked him as heartily as if he had written himself. "'Tis only from James, however, as she looked at the direction. "'She opened it. It was from Oxford, and to this purpose. "'Dear Catherine, though God knows with little inclination for writing, "'I think it my duty to tell you that everything is at an end between Miss Thorpe and me. "'I left her and Bath yesterday, never to see either again. "'I shall not enter into particulars, they would only pain you more.' You will soon hear enough from another quarter to know where lies the blame, and I hope you will acquit your brother of everything but the folly of too easily thinking his affection returned. Thank God I am undeceived in time, but it is a heavy blow, after my father's consent had been so kindly given. But no more of this. She has made me miserable for ever. Let me soon hear from you, dear Catherine. You are my only friend. Your love I do build upon— I wish your visit at Northanger may be over before Captain Tilney makes his engagement known, or you will be uncomfortably circumstanced. Poor Thorpe is in town. I dread the sight of him. His honest heart would feel so much. I have written to him and my father. Her duplicity hurts me more than all. Till the very last, if I reasoned with her, she declared herself as much attached to me as ever, and laughed at my fears. I'm ashamed to think how long I bore with it. But if ever a man had reason to believe himself loved, I was that man. I cannot understand even now what she would be at, for there could be no need for my being played off to make her secure of Tilney. We parted at last by mutual consent. Happy for me had we never met. I can never expect to know such another woman. Dearest Catherine, beware how you give your heart. Believe me, etc. 
Catherine had not read three lines before her sudden change of countenance, her short explanations of sorrow and wonder, declared her to be receiving unpleasant news, and Henry, earnestly watching her through the whole letter, saw plainly that it ended no better than it began. He was prevented, however, from even looking his surprise by his father's entrance. They went to breakfast directly, but Catherine could hardly eat anything. Tears filled her eyes and even ran down her cheeks as she sat. The letter was one moment in her hand, then in her lap, then in her pocket, and she looked as if she knew not what she did. The general, between his cocoa and his newspaper, had luckily no leisure for noticing her, but to the other two her distress was equally visible. As soon as she dared leave the table she hurried away to her own room, but the housemaids were busy in it and she was obliged to come down again. She turned into the drawing-room for privacy, but Henry and Eleanor had likewise retreated thither and were at that moment deep in consultation about her. She drew back, trying to beg their pardon, but was with gentle violence forced to return, and the others withdrew. After Eleanor had affectionately expressed a wish of being of use or comfort to her, after half an hour's free indulgence of grief and reflection, Catherine felt equal to encountering her friends, but whether she should make her distress known to them was another consideration. Perhaps, if particularly questioned, she might just give an idea, just distinctly hint at it, but not more. To expose a friend, such a friend as Isabella had been to her, and then their own brother so closely concerned in it. She believed she must waive the subject altogether. Henry and Eleanor were by themselves in the breakfast room, and each, as she entered it, looked at her anxiously. Catherine took her place at the table, and after a short silence, Eleanor said, "'No bad news from Fullerton, I hope. Mr. and Mrs. Morland, your brothers and sisters, I hope they are none of them ill.' "'No, thank you,' sighing as she spoke. "'They're all very well. My letter was from my brother at Oxford.' Nothing further was said for a few minutes, and then, speaking through her tears, she added, "'I do not think I shall ever wish for a letter again.' "'I am sorry,' said Henry, closing the book he had just opened. "'If I had suspected the letter of containing anything unwelcome, I should have given it with very different feelings. "'It contained something worse than anybody could suppose. Poor James is so unhappy. You will soon know why.' "'To have so kind-hearted, so affectionate a sister,' replied Henry warmly, "'must be a comfort to him under any distress. "'I have one favour to beg,' says Catherine shortly afterwards in an agitated manner, "'that if your brother should be coming here you will give me notice of it that I may go away. "'Our brother, Frederick! "'Yes, I'm sure I should be very sorry to leave you so soon, but something has happened that would make it very dreadful for me to be in the same house with Captain Tilney. Eleanor's work was suspended while she gazed with increasing astonishment, but Henry began to suspect the truth, and something in which Miss Thorpe's name was included passed his lips. "'How quick you are!' cried Catherine. "'You have guessed it, I declare!' And yet when we talked about it in Bath, you little thought of its ending so. Isabella, no wonder now I have not heard from her. Isabella has deserted my brother and is to marry yours. Could you have believed there had been such inconsistency and fickleness and everything that is bad in the world? I hope, so far as it concerns my brother, you are misinformed. I hope he has not had any material share in bringing on Mr. Morland's disappointment. His marrying Miss Thorpe is not probable. I think you must be deceived so far. I'm very sorry for Mr. Morland, sorry that anyone you love should be unhappy, but my surprise will be greater at Frederick's marrying her than any other part of the story. It is very true, however. You shall read James's letter yourself. Stay, there is one part, recollecting with a blush the last line. Will you take the trouble of reading to us the passages which concern my brother? "'No, read it yourself,' cried Catherine, whose second thoughts were clearer. "'I do not know what I was thinking of,' blushing again that she had blushed before. "'James only means to give me good advice.' He gladly received the letter, and, having read it through with close attention, returned it, saying, "'Well, if it is to be so, I can only say that I am sorry for it. Frederick will not be the first man who has chosen a wife with less sense than his family expected.' I do not envy his situation, either as a lover or a son. 
Miss Tilney, at Catherine's invitation, now read the letter likewise, and having expressed also her concern and surprise, began to inquire into Miss Thorpe's connections and fortune. "'Her mother is a very good sort of woman,' was Catherine's answer. "'What was her father?' "'A lawyer, I believe. They live at Putney.' "'And are they a wealthy family?' "'No, not very. I do not believe Isabella has any fortune at all. "'But that will not signify in your family. Your father is so very liberal. "'He told me the other day that he only valued money as it allowed him to promote the happiness of his children.' "'The brother and sister looked at each other. "'But,' said Eleanor after a short pause, "'would it be to promote his happiness to enable him to marry such a girl?' She must be an unprincipled one, or she could have not used your brother so. And how strange an infatuation on Frederick's side! A girl who, before his eyes, is violating an engagement voluntarily entered into with another man. Is it not inconceivable, Henry? Frederick, too, who always wore his heart so proudly, who found no woman good enough to be loved. That is the most unpromising circumstance, the strongest presumption against him. When I think of his past declarations, I give him up. Moreover, I have too good an opinion of Miss Thorpe's prudence to suppose that she would part with one gentleman before the other was secured. It is all over with Frederick, indeed. He is a deceased man, defunct in understanding. Prepare for your sister-in-law, Eleanor, and such a sister-in-law as you must delight in. Open, candid, artless, guileless, with affections strong but simple, forming no pretensions and knowing no disguise. "'Such a sister-in-law, Henry, I should delight in,' said Eleanor with a smile. "'But perhaps,' observed Catherine, "'though she has behaved so ill by our family, she might behave better by yours. "'Now she has really got the man she likes, she may be constant.' "'Indeed, I am afraid she will,' replied Henry. "'I am afraid she will be very constant, unless a baronet should come in her way. "'That is Frederick's only chance. I will get the bath paper and look over the arrivals.' You think it's all for ambition, then? And upon my word, there are some things that seem very like it. I cannot forget that when she first knew what my father would do for them, she seemed quite disappointed that it was not more. I never was so deceived in anyone's character in my life before. Among all the great variety that you have known and studied. My own disappointment and loss in her is very great, but as for poor James, I suppose he will hardly ever recover it. Your brother is certainly very much to be pitied at present, but we must not in our concern for his sufferings undervalue yours. You feel, I suppose, that in losing Isabella you lose half yourself. You feel a void in your heart which nothing else can occupy. Society is becoming irksome, and as for the amusements in which you were wont to share at Bath, the very idea of them without her is abhorrent. You would not, for example, now go to a ball for the world. You feel that you have no longer any friend to whom you can speak with unreserve, on whose regard you can place dependence, or whose counsel in any difficulty you could rely on. You feel all this? No, said Catherine, after a few moments' reflection. I do not, ought I? To say the truth, I am hurt and grieved that I cannot still love her, that I am never to hear from her, perhaps never to see her again. But I do not feel so very much afflicted as one would have thought. You feel as you always do, what is most to the credit of human nature. Such feelings ought to be investigated that they may know themselves. Catherine, by some chance or other, found her spirit so very much relieved by this conversation that she could not regret her being led on, though so unaccountably, to mention the circumstance which had produced it. Whew, okay. Lots has happened. See why I said I don't know why I thought this was kind of meh chapters. Let's go back to the beginning. So in the beginning, we have Catherine doing everything she can to go and see Eleanor's mom's room. This is where we get the dimity bed and the bath stove. Here's why it mattered contextually that these things were popular a while ago. Oh, if you calculate around, and Jane Austen has been very, very careful with all of her calculations, whether it's holidays, length of days, time spans to get to certain times of the year, and distances between places, and how fast horses can travel, she's been very, very good about calculating all of this stuff in some 
crazy amount of specificity. Here's another instance where she's done that. Dimity bedspreads were popular around the time that Eleanor and Henry's mother would have died. It hasn't been replaced with something more modern and newer and perhaps more fashionable. The bath stove, the hob grate, was in use and popular at the time of the mother's death as well, even though the Rumsford stove had just recently come out. Now, the rest of the house seems to have been upgraded with Rumsford stoves, but not this room, because nobody's been in this room, so there was no reason to pay for it being upgraded. So, again, just these little context clues that Austin is, is giving us. Now, Henry catching Catherine, catching her out and, and figuring out that she's experiencing these flights of fancy, and I put that in air quotes, around the idea that Eleanor and, and Henry's father in some way contributed to the death of their mother. It's such a gothic novel trope that it's not a surprise. And when I first went through the book, I kind of heard this, this scene where Henry calls her out as almost um, like the scene from Emma where Mr. Knightley chews Emma out for her, her bad behavior with Miss Bates. And there is, this, I think, a certain amount of accuracy with that parallel. However, I think Mr. Knightley's bounce back from that position isn't quite as clear and and maybe not even as immediate as Henry's bounce back is here. And I think that there's a specific reason for that. On their way to Northanger Abbey, when Henry and Catherine were together in the carriage, Henry had that wonderful, ridiculous, goofy monologue where he was monologuing all of the gothic elements that she should or could be expecting to see when they get to the Abbey. He, of course, knowing that none of it was real, true, or accurate, or even sort of matched anything except for the basic exterior of the house. I mean, even the windows in the mother's room are sash windows. They're not those gothic leaded panes in the diamond shape. You know, it's completely modern for the time. So for Catherine to have kind of gone overboard with this, ooh, I wonder, ooh, maybe, melodrama. Henry's a, a very introspective and thoughtful person. And by that, I mean he is full of thought. He thinks a lot. He also think, seems to think a lot about people and motivation. He has certainly demonstrated that before, which I think is probably not a bad idea if you're going to be a clergyman, because uh, when people come to you for help and guidance, you will probably have some insight for them. That being said, I think Henry realizes that he is in some way culpable for Catherine having gone down this twisty road. And so when she re-enters the room after having been mortified and embarrassed and, and horrified by her own behavior, she now finds him to be more generous of spirit and amenable to her and not being judgy about her, which is lovely and, and important. The other thing that I thought was interesting with it was that when we get the letter from James, we find out that he is just as melodramatic and naive as Catherine. <laughs> and naive, I say, because he doesn't seem to realize that Thorpe is just as big a jerk as Isabella. So, so the, the next thing that Henry did after the revelation of James's letter, the next interesting thing that I thought he did was after they, he and Eleanor kind of come to terms with the reality of the situation, Henry says, after making it clear that his, his brother is up a bad creek without any kind of paddle, he turns to his sister and says, prepare for your sister-in-law, Eleanor, and such a sister-in-law as you must delight in. Now, I expected him to get snarky here. But instead, he says, open, candid, artless, guileless, with affections strong but simple, forming no pretensions and knowing no disguise. Okay, if that's snark, that is an amazing double entendre snark, because that is not Isabella, but that is absolutely Catherine. So is this code for he's going to propose to Catherine? We don't know. 
We do know that he is not such a lousy judge of character as to think that any of those things would apply to Isabella. So I thought that was interesting. And then there's another interesting Henry moment, I thought, a page later. I don't think he's being snarky or mean. I think he is waxing on about something that he cares about, which is people and how people feel. So when he, he says, your, your brother is much to be pitied, but don't undervalue your own feelings. And then he goes through this kind of laundry list of all the ways you could feel after losing a friend, basically because they've, they've betrayed you somehow. And at the end of it, he says, you feel all this. And it's a question mark. And she says, no, I don't. Should I? And this tells us everything we need to know about Catherine and her relationship with Isabella, because we saw how Catherine responded when she felt that Eleanor and Henry had been slighted by Isabella's behavior. You know, she raced through town into their home, pushing aside the doorman and everything, and made her peace with them. Here she's not feeling at all that upset for herself, for her loss of Isabella. This is Henry once again using tropes of the time, and especially of Gothic novels. A true heroine in a Gothic novel would have felt all of those feelings, the betrayal, the idea that you couldn't possibly go to a dance, all of this stuff, you know, the, the back of the hand to the forehead, the swooning, the, oh, you know, I'm so melancholy, I can't possibly dot, 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 fill in the blank. He's providing the script for her for how she should feel were she a gothic heroine, and she is not that person. So once again, she's failed to live up to the gothic heroine persona, but in doing so has proven herself to be a much more likable and honestly better person. And this is one of the things that I have loved about Jane Austen books, and I have a feeling that this has something to do with her longevity and popularity forever since these books came out. And it is this. She's very careful not to make her good people perfect or her bad people completely vile. Every heroine or hero, ingenue or leading man in her stories, they have their good points and they have their bad points. Maybe an unequal mixture, maybe more good than bad, but they are never perfect. And the same goes true for the bad people. There are things they do or say that redeem them somewhat and make them complicated. It's one of the reasons why you can have Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy. And one of the big turning points in Pride and Prejudice is when Darcy sees how selfless and truly how, how much care there is from Elizabeth to her sister when her sister gets sick. And this is the, the turning point for him in noticing that there is more depth to this woman than he had expected. Here we have a similar thing. Catherine is not at all upset for herself. All of her attention is focused on her brother. And I thought that was kind of lovely. So, yay Jane Austen, yay Northanger Abbey, yay you for making it through another episode. Have a great week. Be well, be safe, take care of each other. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Episode 559, Honeysuckle Road. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I went on a walk yesterday morning, and as I turned down, the road that I often walk, I was whacked in the face by smells. <laughs> it had already smelled very nice all morning. It was very loamy and kind of moist, which is not normally, as you know, what I like <laughs> in my weather. <laughs> but it did smell just lovely yesterday morning when I went out for the walk early in the day. And so turning onto the the road, I wasn't surprised that the smells changed because there's a creek that runs alongside the road and it leads into a pond. And so it is kind of a, a different quiet patch. But this was so sweet smelling. And I thought, oh, I, I want something must be blooming. And it didn't occur to me that it would be on the side of the road, like the entire road, 
the whole half mile that I walked. And it was honeysuckle. And it was just one of those beautiful moments, one of those perfect moments that you get every once in a while. And I thought it was honeysuckle, but I wasn't sure because it's been so bloody long since I've smelled honeysuckle. So I pinched off a little piece and brought it home and left it on the counter for Andrew. And I wrote on a paper towel, honeysuckle, question <laughs> mark. And I came down or came back upstairs later and he'd written, yes, exclamation point. So I brought it down and I put it into one of the little mason jars of water that I have on my desk for painting and used one of my quilting clips to hold it in place. And I proceeded to paint it. And I have to tell you, it is perhaps the first time that I have done a, a quick little watercolor study like that and actually been happy with it. So, so it was a, a honeysuckle road that I found. And and I have a little honeysuckle still on my desk. It's a little bit more yellow, but it still smells really good. So I hope you have some happy, pretty, perfect moments like that for you this week as well. Uh, it was a nice gift to get in the middle of all the crazy as work winds down. So that's all there is to say about that. However, I got four, count them, voicemails over the last week, and I think week and a half because I think I forgot to pick them up last week. So you might want to have pencil and paper or pen around nearby because our first caller gives us several things that sound imminently watchable and entertaining and exactly up our alleys. So that's the first. And then uh, we also hear from Janalee and Tara. So here we go with our voicemails. Hi, Heather. This is Karis, spelled and pronounced like charismatic, uh, Nimrodita on Ravelry. Um, Long-time listener, but I think this is the first time I've actually called or emailed. Um, so I had a few things, actually. Um, first of all, you mentioned pottery in the last episode. Um, and, of course, my mind immediately went to a show on HBO Max called The Great Pottery Throwdown, uh, which is filmed in Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire. Um, I really enjoyed watching all of these uh, amateur potters try all these crazy challenges during the pandemic, and uh, I thought that the Craftlet people might also want to get in on that action. Uh, second of all, I love that you keep mentioning uh, Patricia Reed. I discovered her as a teenager and absolutely love her. Still have a, quite a bit of her books in my collection, uh, including The Grand Tour, which I don't know if you've read, but it's the sequel to The Enchanted Chocolate Pot, and uh, Marilyn the Magician and Magician's Ward. I think those might have been the first books that I actually got into of hers. Um, those are truly excellent. Um, and then finally, on YouTube, and I believe I also on Amazon Prime, there is a series called Secrets of the Castle, where uh, some people over in France have embarked on a 25-year project to build a 13th century castle using only the technology available at the time. So if anyone was wondering how they actually managed to build a turret, considering that they didn't have, you know, steam or engines or anything like that, I highly suggest taking a look. Um, on YouTube, it's on a channel called Real Royalty, and then the subtitle is Secrets of the Castle. Hi, Heather. This is Janelle. I'm at some hikes on Ravelry. I just finished listening to episode 57. Um, <laughs> General Kelly's an interesting guy, is me. Like, he tells his children, well, specifically Eleanor, to do stuff, and then he goes ahead and does it himself, which I've known people like that before. They just can't delegate very well because no one else will do it as well as they do. But I think it's really funny. Um, we kind of get to know him a little bit better, and it's it's kind of interesting to me that he's so – I don't know if smug is the best word to describe it, but he's so certain – that his way is the best way. And so I love when he's interviewing um, 
when he's interviewing Catherine about Mr. Allen's succession houses and, and how you can tell that, he, well, he's like, oh, that poor man, what he really means is, isn't it sad that he can't be exactly like me because I'm perfect and I am interested in all of the p- most appropriate things. So I just, I just think that's funny. I also thought it was really hilarious that Catherine was suspicious of his need to go walking. Like exercise is a suspicious activity <laughs> because there's a lot of different reasons that he would want to go walking or be by himself in the garden or want to wander around like after dinner. He's like a very kind of robust feeling person. So I could totally see him not wanting to sit down because I actually am married to someone who doesn't actually enjoy sitting down at all ever. So I can totally see that being a thing. But I also think it's funny that she doesn't go to the, oh, the reason he wants to be alone and walk around in the garden is because this pain of losing his wife is so personal and so and so private and so intense. No, it's like for suspicious reasons because he has to be a villain because there has to be a villain because this is an Abby. Um, <laughs> I love that she's talking about the pamphlets that he's reading as stupid, even though they're probably something fairly essential to his understanding of, say, how to better take care of his succession houses or his garden or whatever, or whether they're political pamphlets and they're, you know, giving him the information he needs to be uh, a better uh, congressman. Congressman isn't the right word. They're in the House of Lords, representative of his part of the country. Um, but, yeah, I think it's I, – I love that she uh, – falls asleep instead of waiting up so she can explore the abbey and find poor Mrs. Tilney alive. I'm just, I'm having so much fun with this book, so thanks. Hello, Heather. It is I, Carol Werther. I have missed you these last two weeks because mainly I wondered how crazy did I sound in those 1 a.m. messages I left? Like a lunatic, of course, Sarah. <laughs> Anywho, I had started this week's episode on my drive into Nashville for the second time today, and you mentioned bo- uh, the soap balls. Fun fact. Soap, at this point in time, was made using wood stove ash, particularly wood stove. It had to be wood stove because high is where you get the ash from. And the fat uh, harvested off of animals whenever they were dispatched and broken down into the component parts for me. It's a really interesting process. I'm sure it has a video link out there somewhere for how this is done, but it's a really interesting factoid of uh, that process. The lye and soda ash comes from wood stove ashes that are literally, I, I think they're either put through water or they're soaked in water. I can't remember. But that's how they would get soda ash to make soap. Thought you'd find that interesting. Hi, Heather. This is Jana Lee, um, Knits and Heights and Revelry. I just finished the last episode, the one that you, um, hang on, it's 558. There we go. Um, and I just, I sympathize with um, James and with Catherine, their distress over Isabel breaking the the engagement off, but I just was so tickled at the the language that Jane Austen used in his letter to his sister, in um, James' letter to his sister. Like, I I did feel bad for him, but I was also laughing. I'm never going to see Bath again. I'm never going to see Isabella again. I'm going to be miserable forever. You, dear sister, are my only friend. Thorpe's honest heart, you know, totally missing the point of that particular person. Um, I never again expect to know such a woman. I don't know if that was the exact thing, but I just thought that was so funny. I'm never going to love again because I'll never meet someone as wonderful as she is. And then for General Tony to be too busy with his breakfast to notice Catherine's distress, but both of his children at the table did notice her distress, I think speaks well about them. Um and their intelligence and their sensitivity to other people, but also probably their greater experience with people. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, I I am with Henry on his uh, regards to his brother being actually engaged to Isabella. I wonder if she is 
jumping the gun just a little bit in expectation of his proposal when he hasn't actually said he will. But we'll wait and see. And either way, it will be an interesting next few chapters, right? All right. So things I will be watching. Check. The general being so sure of himself. Oh, generally, you're going to enjoy today's chapters. Soda Ash. Yes, thank you. Totally forgot. And I shall never love again. We get to hear more. Channel e, This these next two chapters were designed for you. I am so excited. So, chapter information for you. Some phrases and terms that we are used to, and some that are uh, idiomatic that I thought you might need to know. Disgust. Disgusting someone with something is more like distaste. Disgust was not as harsh a word back then as it is now, so it, it doesn't mean quite as strongly as it comes across sounding. You'll hear a reference to the Lady Frasers. This is indicative of the fact that they are females who are most likely children of either a duke, a marquis, or an earl, because they would receive the, the title lady if they were uh, daughters therein. And if they were married, they wouldn't be the ladies' Fraser anymore. They would be married <laughs> and have changed their name. Their rank in society would have made them worthy companions or or people to people of note for General Tilney to care about. So he is going to be the one who mentions them. Tilney will also mention that some worthy men in town, so these are not necessarily particularly wealthy people. He's he's obviously kind of the Lord of the Manor set up here. So he'd be the the highest ranking person nearby. So if there was a, a club for men that he had access to he would be the highest ranking person who would go there. But that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be other worthy gentlemen who are there as well. They just wouldn't be as wealthy as he is, or as high ranking militarily, or perhaps parliamentarily. La, 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 la. So he talks about these worthy men have half a buck from Northanger twice a year. Is not talking about a dollar. He's talking about venison. And at the time, because so much of the, the island had been deforested, even by Jane Austen's time, the deer population had gone way down and venison was a treat. And so for him to be able to give venison to these people indicates that his property was grand enough, large enough that families of deer could live on it. And then he would go hunting and then he would parcel out the venison to people he felt merited venison. Henry has an important yet relatively cryptic by today's standards statement that he will make. He says, our pleasures in this world are always to be paid for. Okay, that makes sense and that we often purchase them at a great disadvantage. Okay, so this stuff costs. The pleasures are going to cost us some. Giving ready-moneyed actual happiness, ready money being cash, giving, giving them the money that we've got on hand, for a draft on the future. A draft would be like a check, writing a check, or an IOU for future happiness that may not be honored. The future may not honor that check. The future may not give you the pleasure that you think you are going to get eventually. All right. So ready money and, and draft are not typically used in the United States. Chandler's shops usually are candle sellers. However, when you hear Chandler's shops, it's just little shops on the high street. Because Candle sellers were often kind of like what we think of as a, a general store, the place where you could pick up some food, kind of dry goods, and other things that you needed kind of as, a, as an essential 
part of life. Candles being probably a really obvious one for living back then. A sweep is a curved driveway. It's exactly what you think it is. It's a driveway that sweeps around the front of the house so that you don't have to try and back up a horse and carriage because that would really not be fun. Newfoundland, dogs. I thought it was interesting that this particular breed got mentioned specifically when other breeds didn't seem to have been of note. And it's because they were only recently imported from Newfoundland, from Canada. So it was a fairly new breed in the UK. They were retrievers. They were obviously, they're very pretty dogs and popular at the time. So I thought that was kind of interesting for you dog lovers. Get a little, a little chunk of info just for you. There's a, a reference to bow windows that I thought was interesting. If you think about little shops on the high street, some of them, and the Harry Potter sets did a lovely job with using this particular kind of architecture. It's the windows that curve outward from the shop. I believe Ollivander's or Flourish, Flourish and Blots had windows like this in the, the movie version of, of Harry Potter. Either way, it's a set of window panes that are brought out. So the panes of glass aren't necessarily curved themselves, but they're narrow enough that six, seven, or eight of them could be used to create a curve, which gave them a little bit more real estate jutting out into the street to present what they were selling in the shop and also brought in a little bit more light to the shop as well. Generally, when building shops like this, you would plan for that particular kind of architecture. However, there is such a thing as a patched-on bow, which is not a ribbon. A patched-on bow window is a bow window that is added to a storefront or a building front after the building was built flat. And so creating a way to add a bowed window to that could be a little tricky and often didn't look so good. So it's kind of a scornful comment about a patched on bow. You will hear a reference to bath as being dusty. This is an interesting comment because Bath was one of the few cities at the time that had pretty much universally paved roads. So for Bath to be dusty, either the person saying it is lying or something really odd was going on. Last week I mentioned directions as being the address to of the person to whom you were writing a a letter. There is another part to that, which is if you are writing a letter to someone, the recipient pays for the postage. So if you don't want to hear from someone, you just refuse to pay postage and the letter gets returned. I suppose the, the modern equivalent is if you're trying to contact somebody who has blocked you on social media or texting or, or something like that, the only way you're going to get a hold of them is by getting somebody else to get a message to them. So that's, that's the setup that you will be hearing in the second chapter today. I think we've come across this before, that theaters of the time actually up until, I, I think there are still some places that do this actually now that I'm thinking about it. If you are talking about a five-act play, if you came in after act three, during or after act three, you could come in half price. So for a show you'd already seen before, you could come in and and catch the end for half price. Or, you know, if you just wanted some cheap entertainment and you didn't really care because the play wasn't very good anyway, (laughs) you could just come in and see the last half. And that would be fun and an inexpensive date. References to turbans. So in 1798, France invades Egypt. We know this. This is when the Sphinx lost its nose. This is that whole thing. It also created a fashion wave of turban loving for women. I am sure you have come across images of women in the kind of neoclassical dress that we see from this particular time period, uh, also wearing turbans of different styles. It was in vogue at the time. 
All right, I believe you are armed and ready to listen to today's chapters. We have today chapter 26 and 27, or if you are looking at a two-volume set, chapter 11 and chapter 12 of volume two of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by the fabulous Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 26. From this time, the subject was frequently canvassed by the three young people, and Catherine found with some surprise that her two young friends were perfectly agreed in considering Isabella's want of consequence and fortune as likely to throw great difficulties in the way of her marrying their brother. Their persuasion that the general would, upon this ground alone, independent of the objection that might be raised against her character, oppose the connection, turned her feelings moreover with some alarm towards herself. She was as insignificant and perhaps as portionless as Isabella, and if the heir of the Tilney property had not grandeur and wealth enough in himself, at what point of interest were the demands of his younger brother to rest? The very painful reflections to which this thought led could only be dispersed by a dependence on the effect of that particular partiality, which, as she was given to understand by his words as well as his actions, she had from the first been so fortunate as to excite in the general and by the recollection of some most generous and disinterested sentiments on the subject of money, which she had more than once heard him utter, and which tempted her to think his disposition in such matters misunderstood by his children. They were so fully convinced, however, that their brother would not have the courage to apply in person for his father's consent, and so repeatedly assured her that he had never in his life been less likely to come to Northanger than at the present time, that she suffered her mind to be at ease as to the necessity of any sudden removal of her own. But as it was not to be supposed that Captain Tilney, whenever he made his application, would give his father any just idea of Isabella's conduct, it occurred to her as highly expedient that Henry should lay the whole business before him, as it really was, enabling the general by that means to form a cool and impartial opinion, and prepare his objections on a fairer ground than inequality of situations. She proposed it to him accordingly, but he did not catch at the measure so eagerly as she had expected. No, said he, my father's hands need not be strengthened, and Frederick's confession of folly need not be forestalled. He must tell his own story. But he will only tell half of it. A quarter will be enough. A day or two passed away and brought no tidings of Captain Tilney. His brother and sister knew not what to think. Sometimes it appeared to them as if his silence would be the natural result of the suspected engagement, and at others that it was wholly incompatible with it. The general, meanwhile, though offended every morning by Frederick's remissness in writing, was free from any real anxiety about him, and had no more pressing solicitude than of making Miss Morland's time at Northanger pass pleasantly. He often expressed an uneasiness on this head— feared the sameness of everyday society and employment would disgust her with the place, wished the Lady Frasers had been in the country, talked every now and then of having a large party to dinner, and once or twice began even to calculate the number of young dancing people in the neighbourhood. But then it was such a dead time of year, no wild fowl, no game, and the Lady Frasers were not in the country. And it all ended at last in his telling Henry one morning that when he next went to Woodston, they would take him by surprise there some day or other and eat their mutton with him. Henry was greatly honoured and very happy, and Catherine was quite delighted with the scheme. And when do you think, sir, I may look forward to this pleasure? I must be at Woodston on Monday to attend the parish meeting and probably be obliged to stay two or three days. Well, well, we'll take our chance on one of those days. There's no need to fix. You're not to put yourself at all out of your way. Whatever you may happen to have in the house will be enough. Think I can answer for the young ladies making allowance for a bachelor's table. Let me see. Monday will be a busy day with you. We'll not come on Monday. And Tuesday will be a busy one with me. I expect my surveyor from Brockham with his report in the morning. And afterwards, I cannot in decency fail attending the club. I really could not face my acquaintance if I stayed away now. For as I am known to be in the country, it will be taken exceedingly amiss. And it's a rule with me, Miss Morland, never to give offence of any of my neighbours if a small sacrifice of time and attention can prevent it. They are a set of very worthy men. They have half a buck from Northanger twice a year. I dine with them wherever I can. Tuesday, therefore, we may say is out of the question. 
But on Wednesday, I think, Henry, you may expect us. And we shall be with you early that we may have time to look about us. Two hours and three quarters will carry us to Woodston, I suppose. We shall be in the carriage by ten, so about quarter before one on Wednesday you may look for us. The ball itself could not have been more welcome to Catherine than this little excursion, so strong was her desire to be acquainted with Woodston, and her heart was still bounding with joy, when Hendry, about an hour afterwards, came booted and great-coated into the room where she and Eleanor were sitting, and said, "'I am come, young ladies, in a very moralising strain, to observe that our pleasures in this world are always to be paid for, and that we often purchase them at great disadvantage.' giving ready-moneyed actual happiness for a draft on the future that may not be honoured. Witness myself at this present hour, because I am to hope for the satisfaction of seeing you at Woodston on Wednesday, with bad weather or twenty other causes may prevent, I must go away directly two days before I intended it. Go away, said Catherine with a very long face, and why? Why? How can you ask the question? Because no time is to be lost in frightening my old housekeeper out of her wits because I must go and prepare a dinner for you, to be sure. Oh, not seriously. Aye, and sadly too, for I'd much rather stay. But how can you think of such a thing after what the General said, when he so particularly desired you not to give yourself any trouble, because anything would do? Henry only smiled. I am sure it's quite unnecessary upon your sister's account and mine. You know it to be so, and the General made such a point of your providing nothing extraordinary. Besides, if he had not said half as much as he did, he always has such an excellent dinner at home that sitting down to a middling one for one day could not signify. I wish I could reason like you, for his sake and my own. Good-bye. As tomorrow is Sunday, Eleanor, I shall not return. He went. And it being at any time a much simpler operation to Catherine to doubt her own judgment than Henry's, she was very soon obliged to give him credit from being right, however disagreeable to her his going but the inexplicability of the general's conduct dwelt much on her thoughts. That he was very particular in his eating, she had, by her own as unassisted observation, already discovered. But why should he say one thing so positively and mean another all the while? It was most unaccountable. How were people at that rate to be understood? Who but Henry could be aware of what his father was at? From Saturday to Wednesday, however, they were now to be without Henry. This was the sad finale of every reflection, and Captain Tilney's letter would certainly come in his absence, and Wednesday, she was very sure, would be wet. The past, present and future were all equally in gloom, her brother so unhappy and her loss in Isabella so great, and Eleanor's spirits always affected by Henry's absence. What was there to interest or amuse her? She was tired of the woods and shrubberies, always so smooth and so dry, and the abbey itself was no more to her now than any other house. The painful remembrance of the folly it had helped to nourish and perfect was the only emotion which could spring from a consideration of the building. What a revolution in her ideas! She who has so longed to be in an abbey, now there was nothing so charming to her imagination as the unpretending comfort of a well-connected parsonage, something like Fullerton but better. Fullerton had its faults, but Woodston probably had none, if Wednesday should ever come. It did come, and exactly when it might be reasonably looked for. It came, it was fine, and Catherine trod on air. By ten o'clock the chaise and four conveyed the two from the abbey, and after an agreeable drive of almost twenty miles they entered Woodston, a large and populous village in a situation not unpleasant. Catherine was ashamed to say how pretty she thought it, as the general seemed to think an apology necessary for the flatness of the country and the size of the village, but in her heart she preferred it to any place she had ever been at, and looked with great admiration at every neat house above the rank of cottage and all the little chandler's shops they passed. At the further end of the village, and tolerably disengaged from the rest of it, stood the parsonage, a new-built substantial stone house with its semicircular sweep and green gates and, as they drove up to the door, Henry, with the friends of his solitude, a large Newfoundland puppy, and two or three terriers, was ready to receive and make much of them. Catherine's mind was too full as she entered the house for her to either observe or to say a great deal, until called on by the general for her opinion of it, she had very little idea of the room in which she was sitting. Upon looking round it, then, she perceived in a moment that it was the most comfortable room in the world, 
but she was too guarded to say so, and the coldness of her praise disappointed him. "'We are not calling it a good house,' said he. "'We're not comparing it with Fullerton and Northanger. "'We're considering it as a mere parsonage, small and confined. "'We allow, but decent perhaps, and habitable, "'and altogether not inferior to the generality. "'Or, in other words, I believe there are few country parsonages in England half so good. "'It may admit of improvement, however. "'Far be it for me to say otherwise, and anything in reason. "'A bow thrown out, perhaps?' Though between ourselves this is one thing more than any other of my aversion, it's a patched-on bow. Catherine did not hear enough of this speech to understand or be pained by it, and on other subjects being studiously brought forward and supported by Henry at the same time that a tray full of refreshments was introduced by his servant, the general was shortly restored to his complacency, and Catherine to all her usual ease of spirits. The room in question was of a commodious, well-proportioned size, and handsomely fitted up as a dining parlour, and on their quitting it to walk around the grounds she was shown first into a small apartment, belonging peculiarly to the master of the house, and made unusually tidy on the occasion, and afterwards into what was to be the drawing-room, with the appearance of which, though unfurnished, Catherine was delighted enough even to satisfy the general. It was a prettily shaped room, the windows reaching to the ground, and the view from them pleasant, though only over a green meadows, and she expressed her admiration at the moment with all the honest simplicity with which she felt it. "'Oh, why do you not fit up this room, Mr. Tilney? What a pity not to have it fitted up! It's the prettiest room I ever saw! It is the prettiest room in the world!' "'I trust,' said the General, with the most satisfied smile, "'that it will very speedily be furnished. "'It waits only for a lady's taste.' "'Well, if it were my house, I should never sit anywhere else. "'What a sweet little cottage there is among the trees, "'apple trees, too. "'It is the prettiest cottage.' "'You like it. "'You approve of it as an object. "'It is enough, Henry. "'Remember that Robinson is spoken to about it. "'The cottage remains.' Such a compliment recalled all Catherine's consciousness and silenced her directly, and though pointedly applied to by the general for her choice of a prevailing colour of the paper and hangings, nothing like an opinion on the subject could be drawn from her. The influence of fresh objects and fresh air, however, was of great use in dissipating these embarrassing associations, and having reached the ornamental part of the premises, consisting of a walk round two sides of a meadow on which Henry's genius had begun to act about half a year ago, she was sufficiently recovered to think it prettier than any pleasure ground she had ever been in before, though there was not a shrub in it higher than the green bench in the corner. A saunter into other meadows and through part of the village, with a visit to the stables to examine some improvements and a charming game of play with a litter of puppies just able to roll about, brought them to four o'clock, when Catherine scarcely thought it could be three. At four they were to dine and at six to set off there on their return. Never had any day passed so quickly. She could not but observe that the abundance of the dinner did not seem to create the smallest astonishment in the general. Nay, that he was even looking at the side-table for cold meat which was not there. His son and daughter's observations were of a different kind. They had seldom seen him eat so heartily at any table but his own, and never before known him so little disconcerted by the melted butters being oiled. At six o'clock, the general, having taken his coffee, the carriage again received them, and so gratifying had been the tenor of his conduct throughout the whole visit, so well assured was her mind on the subject of his expectations, that could she have felt equally confident of the wishes of his son, Catherine would have quitted Woodstone with little anxiety as to the how or the when she might return to it. Chapter 27 The next morning brought the following very unexpected letter from Isabella. Bath, April my dearest Catherine, I received your two kind letters with the greatest delight, and have a thousand apologies to make for not answering them sooner. I really am quite ashamed of my idleness, but in this horrid place one can find time for nothing. I have had my pen in my hand to begin a letter to you almost every day since you left Bath, but I have always been prevented by some silly trifle or other. Pray write to me soon and direct to my own home. Thank God we leave this vile place to-morrow. Since you went away I have had no pleasure in it. The dust is beyond anything, and everybody one cares for is gone. I believe if I could see you I should not mind the rest, for you are dearer to me than anybody can conceive. I am quite uneasy about your dear brother, not having heard from him since he went to Oxford. I am fearful of some misunderstanding. 
Your kind offices will set all right. He is the only man I ever did or could love, and I trust you will convince him of it. The spring fashions are partly down, and the hat's the most frightful you can imagine. I hope you spend your time pleasantly, but I'm afraid you never think of me. I will not say all that I could of the family you were with, because I would not be ungenerous, or set you against those you esteem. But it is very difficult to know whom to trust, and young men never know their minds two days together. I rejoice to say that the young man, whom of all others I particularly abhor, has left Bath, will know from this description I must mean Captain Tilney, who, as you may remember, was amazingly disposed to follow and tease me before you went away. Afterwards he got worse. He became quite my shadow. Many girls might have been taken in. There never were such attentions. But I knew the fickle sex too well. He went away to his regiment two days ago, and I trust I shall never be plagued with him again. It is the greatest coxcomb I ever saw and amazingly disagreeable. The last two days he was always by the side of Charlotte Davis. I pitied his taste, but took no notice of him. The last time we met was in Bath Street, and I turned directly into a shop that he might not speak to me. I would not even look at him. He went into the pump room afterwards, but I would not have followed him for all the world. Such a contrast between him and your brother. Pray send me some news of the latter. I'm quite unhappy about him. He seemed so uncomfortable when he went away, with a cold or something that affected his spirits. I would write to him myself, but I have mislaid his direction, and, as I hinted above, I'm afraid he took something in my conduct amiss. Pray explain everything to his satisfaction, or if he still harbours any doubt, a line from himself to me, or a call at Putney when next in town, might set all to rights. I have not been to the rooms this age, nor to the play, except going last night with the Hodges, for a frolic at half price. They teased me into it, and I was determined that they should not say I shut myself up because Tilney was gone. We happened to sit by the Mitchells, and they pretended to be quite surprised to see me out. I knew their spite. At one time they could not be civil to me, but now they are all friendship. I am not such a fool as to be taken in by them, and you know I have pretty good spirit of my own. Anne Mitchell tried to put on a turban like mine as I wore it the week before at the concert, but made a wretched work of it. It happened to become my odd face, I believe, at least Tilney told me so at the time, and I say every eye was upon me, but here's the last man whose word I would take. I wear nothing but purple now. I know I look hideous in it, but no matter. It is your dear brother's favourite colour. Lose no time, my dearest and sweetest Catherine, in writing to him and to me, whomever I am, etc. Such a strain of shallow artifice could not impose even upon Catherine. Its inconsistencies, contradictions and falsehoods struck her from the very first. She was ashamed of Isabella, and ashamed of ever having loved her. Her professions of attachment were now as disgusting as her excuses were empty, and her demands impudent. Write to James on her behalf. No, James should never hear Isabella's name mentioned by her again. On Henry's arrival from Woodston, she made known to him and Eleanor their brother's safety, congratulating them with sincerity on it, and reading aloud the most material passages of her letter with strong indignation. When she had finished it, "'So much for Isabella,' she cried, "'for all our intimacy. She must think me an idiot, or she could not have written so. But perhaps this is served to make her character better known to me than mine is to her. I see what she has been about. She is a vain coquette, and her tricks have not answered.' I do not believe she had ever any regard either for James or for me, and I wish I had never known her. It will soon be as if you never had, said Henry. There is but one thing I cannot understand. I see that she has had designs on Captain Tilney which have not succeeded, but I do not understand what Captain Tilney has been about all this time. Why should he pay her such attentions as to make her quarrel with my brother, and then fly off himself? I have very little to say for Frederick's motives, such as I believe them to have been. He has his vanities as well as Miss Thorpe, and the chief difference is that, having a stronger head, they have not yet injured himself. If the effect of his behaviour does not justify him with you, we had better not seek after the cause. Then you do not suppose he ever really cared about her? I am persuaded that he never did, and only made believe to do so for mischief's sake. Henry bowed his assent. Well, then, I must say that I do not like him at all. Though it has turned out so well for us, I do not like him at all. As it happens, there is no great harm done, because I do not think Isabella had any heart to lose. 
but I suppose he had made her very much in love with him. But we must first suppose Isabella to have had a heart to lose, consequently to have been a very different creature, and in that case she would have met with very different treatment. It is very right that you should stand by your brother, and if you would stand by yours you would not be much distressed by the disappointment of Miss Thorpe. But your mind is warped by an innate principle of general integrity, and therefore not accessible to the cool reasonings of family partiality or a desire for revenge. Catherine was complimented out of further bitterness. Frederick could not be unpardonably guilty while Henry made himself so agreeable. She resolved on not answering Isabella's letter and tried to think no more of it. All right, we got to see where Henry lives. It's very new. It's so new that the drawing room hasn't even been finished yet. And we've heard from Isabella. I know. Right? Wow. Just wow. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the beginning. Because in the, in the beginning, Catherine is suffering from slowly starting to understand that if the feeling is that General Tilney won't really be happy with Frederick and Isabella being connected... And if it's because Isabella doesn't have enough money, then that causes a new problem for Catherine because Catherine knows she doesn't probably have a whole lot of money. But this is interesting because most women of her age at this time would absolutely know what their dowry was going to be. And she has no clue. She just hasn't had a reason to care yet. And she is also not that kind of person. Which is one of the things that makes her so attractive, obviously, to Henry. However, there's another Henry wrinkle here. If Isabella's money isn't enough for Frederick, Frederick's going to inherit the bulk of the estate of his father's estate. Henry's definitely going to be inheriting less. So if Isabella financially isn't good enough for Frederick, how much less good will Catherine be for Henry? So that's where we start out with chapter 26. That's kind of the place where Catherine's mind is at. And generally, I hope you enjoyed General Tilney in today's chapters. Oh my gosh, when they're deciding what, what day to go visit Henry, and it starts with, well, we'll just surprise you. I'm sure it won't be a problem. Down to, oh, but I can't do it that day. Oh, no, no, I can't do that. Well, and you know, I can't do it. It has nothing to do with what's good for Henry. <laughs> it's only, it's only the general. And he is so not self-aware. He's just, he is a lusciously written character. He's, he's a lot of fun, especially in these chapters. And then when they're touring Henry's house and the general seems to care so much about what Catherine says and take it to heart when she doesn't have anything to say about her room, you know, as though it's a slight upon him, it's insulting to him. And of course, in some ways it would be because we know him well enough now to know that if this house has been built by him, it has been built by him. He has made all the decisions. Henry has not made any. In fact, it, I'm fairly certain that in a situation like this, one of the reasons that the drawing room hasn't been fitted out with furniture or anything yet is because Henry is a bachelor and therefore Henry has no need of a drawing room at this point in life, he does have need of a dining room, which is where he met his guests to begin with. And so the, the general would, of course, have said, well, we'll fit this up first because this is the only room you're really going to <laughs> need to occupy. Ah, oh. But then when Catherine goes into the, the drawing room and sees this view and the windows and these lovely, they aren't necessarily French windows that, you know, French doors that are also windows. They could have been but the fact that it's floor-to-ceiling windows really indicates that the view is worth it. And so for her to love this view so much and it be expressive about it, and then mention this, the apple trees and this pretty cottage, General Tilney's response is, you like it? You approve it as an object. <laughs> it is enough, period. That's all he needed. He just needed to know that she approved of this, that's fine. And then says, Henry, remember that Robinson has spoken to about it. The cottage, 
remains. Robinson may have been the architect or the the landscape architect for the property. The cottage may be one of those follies that were built at the time. It may have been an actual craftsman cottage at as well, but chances are it was a cottage that was put there to be picturesque. And so when he says, you remember Robin is is spoken to about it, meaning General Tilney had probably talked to Robinson about having it removed. But now, now that Catherine approves of it, it remains. <laughs> so, so there it is. It's also interesting that he calls him Robinson, because if he were of a particularly lower rank or lower class, he would have been called by his first name. If he had been of a high enough class, he would have been referred to as a Mr. or military title, Robinson. But in this case, he's, he's a respected professional. And so he, he merits being called by his last name, which I'm, I'm re-listening to all of the Amelia Peabody books. So, of course, all I can think of is mm, Peabody. Because Barbara Rosenblatt, as a reader, I'm just going to go on Audible now f- for the next, probably it's going to take a year. And anything Barbara Rosenblatt has read and recorded, I'm just going to listen to. If you haven't had the pleasure of listening to Barbara Rosenblatt read an Amelia Peabody mystery, I highly recommend that you do. Just like the the reader who did, let's see, what were some of the other ones that I've mentioned over the last pandemic year? CUPS, the Corporation for Ultra Human Protection. The reader who who read that book did a spectacular job. The guy who read the Bob books, We Are Legion, We Are Bob. He also does an extraordinary job of voicing 40 different characters easily, including Riker from Next Generation, Star Trek The Next Generation, dead on Riker, and a dead on Admiral Akbar from Star Wars A New Hope. And the woman who reads the St. Mary's, the Chronicles of St. Mary's, the um, time-traveling historian books, which are very funny, but also very, very well-read. The, the performances are just spectacular. And then uh, my other new favorite, Kavna, who reads the Rivers of London series. He also does a remarkable job with voices. And I have to tell you, at the end of one of the, I don't remember which one, but at the end of one of the Amelia Peabody's stories, Elizabeth Peters, which is a nom de plume, she and Barbara Rosenblatt were interviewed by Recorded Books. And I think this would have been in 98 or 99 when they recorded this interview. And it is very funny to hear both of them because they are so American. Barbara Rosenblatt sounds like either she's like Brenda Vaccaro and she was born with a voice that sounds like she smoked two or three packs a day from birth on, or she did or does, because she has this marvelous, raspy voice, but clearly has a Julie Andrews range, because she can go very high and believable and hold it, and very low as well, as she does when she reads Emerson, last name only, and Peabody, last name only, which is why I got off on this kick. But the funny thing is, it sounds like, it, the, the question isn't asked directly in this interview, but it is asked directly when Ben Aronovich is asked in an interview with him and Kobna, is it Kobna Holbrook-Smith? He has a fabulous name, the, the gentleman who does the reading for the Rivers of London books. In their interview, Ben Aronovich is asked directly how long did it take before you started writing characters that you thought would be difficult for Kobna to read and perform? And Aronovich is like, three books. By the fourth one, I'm throwing in whatever I can throw in. It's just, I'm, I'm giving him really difficult German, basically, or particularly arcane locations in the world. So Kobna has to go do research on those accents. I guarantee you... Elizabeth Peters did the same thing to Barbara Rosenblatt because the further I've gotten in the series past that, the more German is showing up. And not not just German characters, which Rosenblatt just 
does a spectacular job on because her her German characters don't all sound the same either. She's got different accents from different parts of Germany, which is just stunning. But now in the book that I'm in right now, which is I'm almost at the end, she threw in in the first paragraph the title of a German text that is so complex. And you can hear Barbara Rosenblatt smiling by the time she reaches the end of the title. And it's got to be because she's just so bloody proud of herself for getting through it properly, perfectly, and flamboyantly. It is just a treat to listen to performances that are this good. So I'll leave you with that. Those are fun, fun listens, fun reads, but especially fun listens. Oh, and the last thing, uh, one I learned about from a guy at work, one I learned about last night on the Thursday night craft lit Zoom, which again, you are all welcome to join in on the early by East Coast standards, early morning Tuesday or 7 p.m. Eastern time Thursday night. We have our Zoom chats and last night, oh Darn it, I can't remember who brought it up, but God bless him for doing it. There is on Peacock TV, which is a streaming service, I believe, that's connected to NBC because they're the Peacock. So I'm not sure where else you can find this. But if you can, just go look at the, the image for the promo image for this new show. It's a Peacock original. It's called We Are Lady Parts. It's a punk band. It's a... Multi ethnic, multi racial girls punk band. And I haven't watched it yet. All I'm telling you is that the image, the, the thumbnail for it is hilarious. Yeah. I'm just, I'll put a link in the show notes and you can, you can look at the image yourself. I am going to watch. I am very excited. I hope it is as good as its image. Then the guy at work also told me very funny if you're looking for something funny, but probably I'm going to say a little on the vulgar side, so don't watch it with kids first. Frank of Ireland, which is Mad-Eye Moody's son, Brian Gleason. It's, it's not the first show that he's done. It, I think, is the first show where he's kind of the main draw. And the, the tagline, it's on Amazon Prime, at least in the United States it is, the tagline for it, or the description for it on the trailer, which I will also link out to for you, is Brian Gleason stars as Frank Marin, a 32-year-old catastrophe, a misanthropic fantasist in arrested development who's convinced that the world owes him. He's also our hero. So he's just kind of a mess, but he's a charmingly funny mess, at least in the trailer. So all right, there's two. I don't know if you're going to be able to get both of them depending on where you live, although VPNs definitely help. I know I have moved myself by VPN to the UK on more than one occasion to be able to see something that is only available in the UK. And so far it's worked. Some, some streaming services, I believe Netflix is one of them, they've figured out a way to be able to tell if you're using a VPN. So they have now shut, shut that door down. Uh, but not everybody, not all of them. All right. That's it for me for this week. You take care of yourselves. Don't forget to call in if you have any comments about the book that you would like to share. 206-350-1642. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care of yourself. Get your vaccine. Wear a mask. Take care of each other. Talk to you later. Bye. Episode 560. As you were. Well, hello. How are you? I am unemployed. Which is code for, I'm fine. Our contract has ended. Thank you, Legislature of Pennsylvania. It's been a long, strange trip, but it was a really, really good one. Training contact tracers and case investigators and working with the Pennsylvania Department of Health has been fascinating and 
rewarding and edifying, but to sound like a total cliched beach novel, the, the best the best part was the people you meet along the way. I got lucky, just like when I was teaching in New York City, to be surrounded by a team of people who were extraordinary. And I mean, nobody goes out for a job as a contact tracer who doesn't want to be a helper, going back to Mr. Rogers, a helper instead of a terror downer. <laughs> That's the technical terminology, you know. It was, what, nine months, 10 months of being surrounded by really, really wonderful people start to finish. So big thank you to everyone around the country who has gone out to work in contact tracing, whether you're volunteer or you're being paid for your time, your extraordinary amount of time. It's really wonderful. On the other side of my life, those of you who have listened for a really long time probably need to sit down. We just celebrated Aaron's 21st birthday. I know. I'm still, I'm having issues. <laughs> it's difficult. If I can upload it, I, I took a series of pictures of Aaron having a sip of a Jack and Ginger where he's making goofy faces and really being quite funny. If I can export it properly, you will get to hear their voices, both Aaron and Aiden, and see them being their goofy selves. I will also export something that Aiden was encouraging me to do, which is, uh, there's a whole thing. If you, if you don't have kids who watch TikTok or who have been on YouTube for, I don't know, the last 10 years, 15 years, there's a thing that occurs often. Oh, and on Instagram too, I think now, speed painting, where people record themselves doing something painting-wise whether it's digitally on the Procreate app, which can automatically record what your pencil is doing on the screen, or whether it's painting in, in real time. So I tried it with a picture of the boys from Aaron's dinner, and I've sped it up four times, I think. It was an interesting experiment. I don't know if I'm going to do it again. He thinks that I should be putting out a playlist on YouTube of me doing speed versions of whatever crafty thing I'm up to. Um, so it'd be mostly just my hands, watching my hands, and maybe me talking about it. I'm still not sure about that. Anyway, I'll, I'll see if I can get that uploaded for you and in the show notes as well. Obviously, lots of things have been put on hold while I was working like crazy on the contact tracing thing. So I'm going to get back into fixing broken things on various websites and cleaning things up like that. And we are nearing the end of Northanger Abbey, which means I have to pick our next book. I think I know which way I'm going to go. I'm not positive yet, but it is probably going to be a mystery. Not like Woman in White. Nothing can be like Woman in White, right? Along with going out to dinner for Aaron's birthday, yes, that was kind of shocking to be in a restaurant. Uh, we are all four of us now fully vaccinated, and even so, anytime we walk in anywhere, we are all wearing masks. We just don't want to freak people out because, you know, it's not like you're walking around with a t-shirt on that says, hey, I got vaccinated. So we, we're doing our best to make sure that uh, we don't add to confusion or stress for other people, but we did absolutely take our masks off and have dinner indoors, and then we went to see the movie In the Heights, which was also kind of surreal because there were four other people in the theater. It was great to be in a theater again, but it was most great to see In the Heights. If you've ever wanted to see a slice of a life that you may not otherwise have any contact to, it reminded me in that way of the movie that came out several years ago called Big Sick that was I think it was pretty autobiographical. It was Kamal Nanjiani. He's in Silicon Valley and a bunch, bunch of other stuff. But Holly Hunter was in it and Ray Romano was in it. And well, In the Heights definitely gives you kind of a fiddler on the roof vision of 
a life that you may not otherwise have any contact with. What do I mean by Fiddler on the Roof? What I mean is Anthony Ramos, who was the original Broadway John Lawrence and Philip Hamilton, he plays Usnavi, who you will love when you watch the movie, finding out why his name is Usnavi. He plays Usnavi, who's very much like Tevya. He starts by saying good morning to you directly to the camera and welcoming you to his little world. And then he goes out in ever widening concentric circles, showing you this is my family. And it's a interesting family. It's not a United States Census Bureau 2.5 children white picket fence family. It's a much more dynamic setup that he is living in. And then you find out what his role is and his family's roles. And then you go the next level out. These are the friends. These are the people who you have contact with all the time. And what are their roles? What are their jobs? How do they function within this close-knit society? It is absolutely beautiful. And just like with Hamilton, where you have everything from show tunes and R&B to bebop and real hardcore Rodgers and Hammerstein throwbacks, both in lyrics and in musical style, he does the same thing with In the Heights, except on a slightly different level. You definitely get the, the show tunes and you have some extraordinary Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers film moments towards the end of the movie. It's just breathtaking. But you are hearing different musical styles of Latin music and Caribbean music that go along with the character who you are watching. So there's a, a whole several layers of depth and information giving going on all the way throughout the movie. You may catch all of it. You may catch none of it. You may just find that it is a beautifully uplifting, happy movie. And how needed is that right now? So needed. It was lovely. Just, just, just lovely. I know there's been controversy about it. Uh, we were talking about it a little bit on the Craftlet Zoom call last night, which again, you are welcome to, and links are in the show notes. Carmen and I both noted that we both recognized that the controversy is legit. It's sad that the first time you have real uh, representation of an enormous, complex, non-white portion of the, the country, there is an almost immediate backlash against it. At the same time, Lin-Manuel Miranda's response is, I'm listening. I get it. I recognize what you're saying. I'm listening. I'll do better next time. Which is lovely. And so grown up. He's just, he's a mensch, is what he is. But controversy aside, go in knowing that you are not going to see a whole lot of dark-skinned Caribbean Latin actors for what it's worth. It's true. The director of the film is the same director who did Crazy Rich Asians. He is, as one of the interviewers on a video interview that I saw on YouTube, one of the interviewers said, amazingly good at food porn. And the f don't go to this movie hungry because when they eat, oh my goodness, yes, please. Especially having uh, spent a, a good portion of my life in, in Tucson where the carne is so good and it's hard to find done right elsewhere. It was lovely. It was just lovely. So I'm going to stop rambling about that and instead switch to rambling about other things. First and foremost, Northanger Abbey. So we are, like I said, heading in towards the end of the book. In fact, I think next week, I think there are three chapters left after today. And I think next week will be the end of the book. There's not a whole lot that you need to know before we listen to today's chapter. One of the cool tidbitty kind of things is you will hear a reference to the loud noise of the house bell. And house bell is hyphenated, H-O-U-S-E hyphen 
B as in boy, E-L-L. This appears to be, according to the OED, one of the earliest moments that we have seen a reference to a doorbell in literature. They weren't normal before this. This is, this is a big deal. Even though you may have had bell poles inside the house that allowed you to alert the serving staff, Downton Abbey style, that you were ready for or that you needed whatever it was that they were about to, to prepare or bring you. Doorbells didn't really exist. You had knockers, Scrooge Marley-like, but you didn't have doorbells, evidently. So just know that when you hear the reference to the house bell, you can feel smug and self-satisfied knowing that this little Jane Austen book happens to have one of the first references. 70 miles of travel at 7 to 8 miles an hour was totally doable at the time in a carriage, in a post chaise, uh, traveling by post, like we talked about before, where you go kind of station to station or post to post, where uh, horses get switched out and you can get a snack if you want to, and then you get back in the carriage and keep going uh, once the new team of horses has been attached. 70 miles, traveling somewhere between 7 and 8 miles an hour, standard issue travel time of seven to eight miles an hour, that would take you 10 or 11 hours minimum to do. Absolutely doable. It would be weird to do that on a Sunday, however. Mail would still have gone and people would still have traveled, but it would have been fewer people than you would see other days of the week, and it would be a little bit more extraordinary to be a person doing the traveling at that time, on that day. You will hear a term used that is used in kind of a complicated way. Later in the chapters we're doing today, you're going to hear this last half to a sentence, and perhaps involve the innocent with the guilty in undistinguishing ill will. Undistinguishing would be, in our terminology, more like indiscriminate. So you would involve somebody who is innocent, you'd conflate them with the guilty, put them all together in the same bowl, and not be able to distinguish who is behaving from ill will versus who is behaving from, you know, the best information they had at the time, doing the best they can. So undistinguishing is really indiscriminate. Last week, we talked about a sweep. This week, we talk about a sweep gate. You will hear this reference. This is the gate from the road, separating the road from the sweep itself. Leading up to the sweep, the, the rounded part of the, what we would call in the States driveway, that would allow you to drive a carriage up to the front door without having to back it up, back down the the rest of the driveway back down to the road. The sweep gate separated the property from the road and could lead to a long straight drive that ended in a sweep, or it could go just right into the sweep itself. But you'll hear a reference to a sweep gate, and that is all that it's talking about. And it does mean that you would probably have to stop, get out, open the gate, get back in, drive through the gate, stop, close the gate. This is why you had gatekeepers. <laughs> and those little gatehouses, because what a pain that would be if you were you know, in a hurry. Just like today on trains and planes where there's a seat back pocket in front of you, carriages that were traveling post, things that carried uh, people who didn't own the carriages, often had little pockets sewn into the sidewalls so that you could put you know, stump something to read or embroidery or whatever, you would have some place to put it other than your lap or in your bag that's strapped to the back of the carriage. So there were inner pockets inside carriages for people to stow stuff while they were traveling. And of course, perhaps, Heather, leave things behind, Heather, as you disembark, Heather. You'll hear a reference to Mechlin, M-E-C-H-L-I-N. This was a very fine, rather intricate lace that was made in Flanders, in Mechelen, Flanders. I'm probably pronouncing Mechelen wrong. 
And as you can imagine, anything that is lace and fine and intricate would be expensive and therefore very desirable. And I think that's everything you need. Because, you know, we're, as we get closer to the end of these books, we have fewer and fewer weird new situations or new terminology. There's a lot of terminology in today's chapters that we'd already gone over because it's just getting re-referenced. But I don't want to spoil anything. I am going to launch us now into chapters 28 and 29 of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by the lovely Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 28. Soon after this, the general found himself obliged to go to London for a week, and he left Northanger, earnestly regretting that any necessity should rob him even for an hour of Miss Morland's company, and anxiously recommending the study of her comfort and amusement to his children as their chief object in his absence. His departure gave Catherine the first experimental conviction that a loss may be sometimes a gain. The happiness with which their time now passed, every employment voluntary, every laugh indulged, every meal a scene of ease and good humour, walking where they liked and when they liked, their hours, pleasures and fatigues at their own command, made her thoroughly sensible of the restraint which the general's presence had imposed, and most thankfully feel their present release from it. Such ease and such delights made her love the place and the people more and more every day, and had it not been for a dread of it soon becoming expedient to leave the one, and an apprehension of not being equally beloved by the other, she would, at each moment of each day, have been perfectly happy. But she was now in the fourth week of her visit. Before the general came home, the fourth week would be turned, and perhaps it might seem an intrusion if she stayed much longer. This was a painful consideration whenever it occurred, and eager to get rid of such a weight on her mind, she very soon resolved to speak to Eleanor about it at once, propose going away, and be guided in her conduct by the manner in which her proposal might be taken. Aware that if she gave herself much time she might feel it difficult to bring forward so unpleasant a subject, she took the first opportunity of being suddenly alone with Eleanor, and of Eleanor's being in the middle of a speech about something very different, to start forth her obligation of going away very soon. Eleanor looked and declared herself much concerned. She had hoped for the pleasure of her company for a much longer time, had been misled, perhaps by her wishes, to suppose that a much longer visit had been promised, and could not but think that if Mr. and Mrs. Morland were aware of the pleasure it was to have her there, they would be too generous to hasten her return. Catherine explained, "'Oh, as to that, Papa and Mamma were in no hurry at all. As long as she was happy, they would always be satisfied. Then why might she ask in such a hurry herself to leave them? Oh, because she'd been there so long. Nay, if you can use such a word, I can urge you no farther, if you think it long. Oh, no, I do not indeed. For my own pleasure, I could stay with you as long again.' and it was directly settled that till she had, her leaving them was not even to be thought of. In having this cause of uneasiness so pleasantly removed, the force of the other was likewise weakened. The kindness, the earnestness of Eleanor's manner in pressing her to stay, and Henry's gratified look on being told that her stay was determined, was such sweet proofs of her importance with them, as left her only just so much solitude as the human mind can ever do comfortably without. She did almost always believe that Henry loved her, and quite always that his father and sister loved and even wished her to belong to them, and believing so far, her doubts and anxieties were merely sportive irritations. Henry was not able to oblige his father's injunction of remaining wholly at Northanger, in attendance on the ladies during his absence in London, the engagement of his curate at Woodston obliging him to leave them on Saturday for a couple of nights. His loss was not now what it had been while the general was at home. It lessened their gaiety but did not ruin their comfort, and the two girls, agreeing in occupation and improving in intimacy, found themselves so well sufficient for the time to themselves that it was eleven o'clock, rather a late hour at the abbey, before they quitted the supper-room on the day of Henry's departure. 
They had just reached the head of the stairs when it seemed, as far as the thickness of the walls would allow them to judge, that a carriage was driving up to the door, and the next moment confirmed the idea by the loud noise of the house bell. After the first perturbation of a surprise had passed away, in a good heaven, what can be the matter? It was quickly decided by Eleanor to be her eldest brother, whose arrival was often as sudden if not so unseasonable, and accordingly she hurried down to welcome him. Catherine walked on to her chamber, making up her mind as well as she could to a further acquaintance with Captain Tilney, and comforting herself under the unpleasant impression his conduct had given her, and the persuasion of his being far too fine a gentleman to approve of her, that at least they should not meet under such circumstances would make their meeting materially painful. She trusted he would never speak of Miss Thorpe, and indeed, as he must by this time be ashamed of the part he had acted, there could be no danger of it, and as long as all mention of bath scenes were avoided, she thought she could behave to him very civilly. In such considerations time passed away, and it was certainly in his favour that Eleanor should be glad to see him, and have so much to say, for half an hour was almost gone since his arrival, and Eleanor did not come up. At that moment Catherine thought she heard her step in the gallery, and listened for its continuance, but all was silent. Scarcely, however, had she convicted her fancy of error, when the noise of something moving close to her door made her start. It seemed as if someone was touching the very doorway, and in another moment a slight motion of the lock proved that some hand must be upon it. She trembled a little at the idea of anyone's approaching so cautiously, but resolving not to be again so overcome by trivial appearances of alarm or misled by a raised imagination, she stepped quietly forward and opened the door. Eleanor, and only Eleanor, stood there. Catherine's spirits, however, were tranquillised but for an instant, for Eleanor's cheeks were pale, and her manner greatly agitated. Though evidently intending to come in, it seemed an effort to enter the room, and still greater to speak when there. Catherine, supposing some uneasiness on Captain Tilney's account, could only express her concern by silent attention, obliged her to be seated, rubbed her temples with lavender water, and hung over her with affectionate solicitude. "'My dear Catherine, you must not, you must not indeed,' were Eleanor's first connected words. "'I'm quite well. This kindness distracts me. I cannot bear it. I come to you on such an errand.' "'Errand? To me? How shall I tell you? Oh, how shall I tell you?' A new idea now darted into Catherine's mind, and turning as pale as her friend, she exclaimed, "'Tis a messenger from Woodston!' "'You are mistaken indeed,' returned Eleanor, looking at her most compassionately. "'It is no one from Woodston. It is my father himself.' Her voice faltered, and her eyes were turned to the ground as she mentioned his name. His unlooked-for return was enough in itself to make Catherine's heart sink, and for a few moments she hardly supposed there were anything worse to be told.' She said nothing, and Eleanor, endeavouring to collect herself and speak with firmness, but with eyes still cast down, soon went on. You are too good, I'm sure, to think the worse of me for the part I'm obliged to perform. I am indeed a most unwilling messenger. After what has so lately passed, so lately been settled between us, how joyfully, how thankfully on my side as to your continuing here, as I hoped, for many, many weeks longer— how can I tell you that your kindness is not to be accepted, and that the happiness your company has hitherto given us is to be repaid by? But I must not trust myself with words. My dear Catherine, we are to part. My father has recollected an engagement that takes our whole family away on Monday. We're going to Lord Longtown's near Hereford for a fortnight. Explanation and apology are equally impossible. I cannot attempt either. My dear Eleanor, cried Catherine, suppressing her feelings as well as she could. Do not be so distressed. The second engagement must give way to a first. I'm very, very sorry we are to part so soon, and so suddenly too, but I'm not offended. Indeed I'm not. I can finish my visit here, you know, any time, or I hope you will come to me. Can you, when you return from this Lord's, come to Fullerton? It will not be in my power, Catherine. Come when you can, then. Eleanor made no answer, 
and Catherine's thoughts recurring to something more directly interesting, she added, thinking aloud, Monday, so soon as Monday and you're all to go? Well, I'm certain of. I shall be able to take leave, however. I need not go till just before you do, you know. Do not be distressed, Eleanor. I can go on Monday very well. My father and mother having no notice of it is very little consequence. The general will send a servant with me, I dare say, half the way, and then I shall soon be at Salisbury, and then I'm only nine miles from home. Ah, oh, Catherine, were it settled so, it would be somewhat less intolerable, and though in such common attentions you would have received but half of what you ought. But how can I tell you? Tomorrow morning is fixed for your leaving us, and not even the hour is left to your choice. The very carriage is ordered, and will be here at seven o'clock, and no servant will be offered you. Catherine sat down, breathless and speechless. I could hardly believe my senses when I heard it, and no displeasure, no resentment that you could feel at this moment, however justly great, could be more than myself. But I must not talk of what I felt. Oh, that I could suggest anything in extenuation. Good God, what will your father and mother say, after courting you from the protection of real friends to this, almost double distance from your home, to have you driven out of the house without the considerations of even decent civility? Dear, dear Catherine, in being the bearer of such a message, I seem guilty myself of all its insult, yet I trust you will acquit me, for, for you must have been long enough in this house to see that I am but a nominal mistress of it, that my real power is nothing. Have I offended the general? said Catherine in a faltering voice. Alas, for my feelings as a daughter, all I know, all that I can answer for, that you can have given him no cause for offence. He certainly is greatly, very greatly discomposed. I have seldom seen him more so. His temper is not happy, and something has now occurred to ruffle it in an uncommon degree, some disappointment, some vexation, which just at this moment seems important, but which I can hardly suppose you to have any concern in, for how is it possible? It was with pain that Catherine could speak at all, and it was only for Eleanor's sake that she attended it. I am sure, she said, I am very sorry if I have offended him, but it was the last thing I would willingly have done. But do not be unhappy, Eleanor. An engagement, you know, must be kept. I am only sorry that it was not recollected sooner that I might have written home, but it is of very little consequence. I hope, I earnestly hope that to your real safety it will be of none, but to everything else it is of the greatest consequence. To comfort, appearance, propriety to your family or to the world? Were your friends, the Allens, still in Bath, you might go to them with comparative ease. A few hours would take you there, but a journey of seventy miles to be taken post by you at your age, alone, unattended. Though the journey is nothing, do not think about that, and if we are to part a few hours sooner or later, you know, makes no difference. I can be ready by seven. Let me be called in time. Eleanor saw that she wished to be alone, and believing it better for each that they should avoid any further conversation, now left her with, I shall see you in the morning. Catherine's swelling heart needed relief. In Eleanor's presence, friendship and pride had equally restrained her tears, but no sooner was she gone that they burst forth in torrents. Turned from the house, and in such a way without any reason that could justify any apology that could atone for the abruptness, the rudeness, nay, the insolence of it. Henry at a distance, not able even to bid him farewell, every hope, every expectation from him suspended, at least, and who could say how long, who could say when they might meet again, and all this by such a man as General Tilney, so polite, so well-bred, and herefore too so particularly fond of her. It was incomprehensible. It was as incomprehensible as it was mortifying and grievous. From what it could arise and where it would end were considerations of equal perplexity and alarm. The manner in which it was done so grossly uncivil, hurrying her away without any reference to her own convenience, or allowing her even the appearance of choice as to the time or mode of her travelling, of two days the earliest fixed on, and of that almost the earliest hour. 
as if resolved to have her gone before he was stirring in the morning, that he might not be obliged even to see her. What could all this mean but an intentional affront? By some means or other she must have had the misfortune to offend him. Eleanor had wished to spare her from so painful a notion, but Catherine could not believe it possible that any injury or misfortune could provoke such ill will against a person not connected, or at least not supposed to be connected with it. Heavily passed the night. Sleep or repose that deserved the name of sleep was out of the question. That room in which her disturbed imagination had tormented her on her first arrival was again the scene of agitated spirits and unquiet slumbers. Yet how different now the source of her inquietude from what it had been then! How mournfully superior in reality and substance! Her anxiety had foundation in fact, her fears in probability, and with a mind so occupied in the contemplation of actual and natural evil, the solitude of her situation, the darkness of her chamber, the antiquity of the building, were felt and considered without the smallest emotion, and though the wind was high, and often produced strange and sudden noises through the house, she heard it all as she lay awake, hour after hour, without curiosity or terror. Soon after six, Eleanor entered her room, eager to show attention or give assistance where it was possible, but very little remained to be done. Catherine had not loitered. She was almost dressed and her packing almost finished. The possibility of some conciliatory message from the general occurred to her as his daughter appeared. What so natural as that anger should pass away and repentance succeed it? And she only wanted to know how far after what had passed an apology might be properly received by her. But the knowledge would have been useless here. It was not called for. Neither clemency nor dignity was put to the trial. Eleanor brought no message. Very little passed between them on meeting. Each found her greatest safety in silence, and few and trivial were the sentences exchanged while they remained upstairs. Catherine, in busy agitation, contemplating her dress, and Eleanor, with more good will than experience, intent on filling the trunk. When everything was done, they left the room. Catherine, lingering only half a minute behind her friend, to throw a parting glance on every well-known cherished object, and went down to the breakfast parlour, where breakfast was prepared. She tried to eat, as well as save herself from the pain of being urged to make her friend comfortable, but she had no appetite, and could not swallow many mouthfuls. The contrast between this and her last breakfast in that room gave her fresh misery, and strengthened her distaste for everything before her. It was not four and twenty hours ago since they had met there to the same repast, but in circumstances how different! With what cheerful ease, what happy though false security, had she then looked around her, enjoying everything present, and fearing little in future, beyond Henry's going to Woodston for a day. Happy, happy breakfast, for Henry had been there. Henry had sat by her and helped her. These reflections were long indulged, undisturbed by any address from her companion, who sat as deep in thought as herself, and the appearance of the carriage was the first thing to startle and recoil them to the present moment. Catherine's colour rose at the sight of it, and the indignity with which she was treated, striking at that instant on her mind with peculiar force, made her for a short time sensible only of resentment. Eleanor seemed now impelled into resolution and speech. "'You must write to me, Catherine,' she cried. "'You must let me hear from you as soon as possible.' Till I know you to be safe at home, I shall not have an hour's comfort. For one letter, at all risks, all hazards, I must entreat. Let me have the satisfaction of knowing that you are safe at Fullerton, and have found your family well, and then, till I can ask for your correspondence as I ought to do, I will not expect more. Direct to me at Lord Longtown's, and I must ask it under cover to Alice. No, Eleanor, if you are not allowed to receive a letter from me, I'm sure I'd better not write. There can be no doubt of my getting home safe. Eleanor only replied, I cannot wonder at your feelings. I will not importune you. I will trust to your own kindness of heart when I am at a distance from you. But this with a look of sorrow accompanying it was enough to melt Catherine's pride in a moment, and she instantly said, Oh, Eleanor, I will write to you indeed there was yet another point which Miss Tilney was anxious to settle, 
though somewhat embarrassed in speaking of it. It had occurred to her that, after so long an absence from home, Catherine might not be provided with money enough for the expense of her journey, and upon suggesting it to her with the most affectionate offers of accommodation, it proved to be exactly the case. Catherine had never thought on the subject till that moment, but upon examining her purse was convinced that, but for this kindness of her friend, she might have been turned from the house without even the means of getting home, and the distress in which she must have been thereby involved, filling the minds of both, scarcely another word was said by other during the time of their remaining together. Short, however, was that time. The carriage was soon announced to be ready, and Catherine, instantly rising, a long and affectionate embrace supplied the place of language in bidding each other adieu, and as they entered the hall, unable to leave the house, without some mention of one whose name had not been yet spoken by either, she paused a moment, and with quivering lips, just made it intelligible that she left her kind remembrance for her absent friend. But with this approach to his name ended all possibility of restraining her feelings, and hiding her face as well as she could with her handkerchief, she darted across the hall, jumped into the chaise, and in a moment was driven from the door. Chapter 29 Catherine was too wretched to be fearful. The journey in itself had no terrors for her, and she began it without either dreading its length or feeling its solitariness. Leaning back in one corner of the carriage, in a violent burst of tears, she was conveyed some miles beyond the walls of the abbey before she raised her head, and the highest point of ground within the park was almost close from her view before she was capable of turning her eyes towards it. Unfortunately, the road she now travelled was the same, which only ten days ago she had so happily passed along in going to and from Woodston, and for fourteen miles every bitter feeling was rendered more severe by the review of the objects on which she had first looked under impressions so different. Every mile, as it brought her nearer to Woodston, added to her sufferings, and when, within the distance of five, she passed the turning which led to it, and thought of Henry so near yet so unconscious, her grief and agitation were excessive. The day which she had spent at that place had been one of the happiest of her life. It was there, it was on that day, that the General had made use of such expressions with regard to Henry and herself, had so spoken and so looked as to give her the most positive conviction of his actually wishing their marriage. Yes, only ten days ago had he elated her by his pointed regard, had he even confused her by his too significant reference. And now, what had she done? What had she omitted to do to merit such a change? The only offence against him, of which she could accuse herself, had been such as was scarcely possible to reach his knowledge. Henry and her own heart only were privy to the shocking suspicions which she had so idly entertained, and equally safe did she believe her secret with each. Designedly, at least, Henry could not have betrayed her. If indeed by any strange mischance his father should have gained intelligence of what he had dared to think and look for, for her causeless fancies and injurious examinations, she could not wonder at any degree of his indignation. If aware of her having viewed him as a murderer, she could not wonder at his even turning her from his house. But a justification so full of torture to herself, she trusted, would not be in his power. Anxious as were all her conjectures on this point, it was not, however, the one on which she dwelt most. There was the thought yet nearer, a more prevailing, more impetuous concern. How Henry would think and feel and look when he returned on the morrow to Northanger and heard of her being gone was a question of force and interest to rise over every other. To be never ceasing, alternately irritating and soothing, it sometimes suggested the dread of his calm acquiescence, and at others was answered by the sweetest confidence in his regret and resentment. To the general, of course, he would not dare speak, but to Eleanor, what might he not say to Eleanor about her? In this unceasing recurrence of doubts and inquiries on any one article of which her mind was incapable of more than momentary repose, the hours passed away, and her journey advanced much faster than she looked for. The pressing anxieties of thought which prevented her from noticing anything before her, 
when once beyond the neighbourhood of Woodston, saved her at the same time from watching her progress, and though no object on the road could engage a moment's attention, she found no stage of it tedious. From this she was preserved, too, by another course, by feeling no eagerness for her journey's conclusion, for to returning in such a manner to Fullerton was almost to destroy the pleasure of meeting with those she loved best. Even after an absence such as hers, an eleven weeks' absence, what had she to say that would not humble herself and pain her family, that would not increase her own grief by the confession of it, extend a useless resentment, and perhaps involve the innocent with the guilty in undistinguishing ill-will? She could never do any justice to Henry and Eleanor's merit. She felt it too strongly for expression, and should a dislike be taken against them, should they be thought of unfavourably on their father's account, it would cut her to the heart. With these feelings, she rather dreaded than sought for the first view of that well-known spire which would announce her within twenty miles of home. Salisbury she had known to be her point on leaving Northanger, but after the first stage she had been indebted to the postmasters for the names of the places which were to then conduct her to it. So great had been her ignorance of her route. She met with nothing, however, to distress or frighten her. Her youth, civil manners and liberal pay procured her the, all the attention that a traveller like herself could require, and stopping only to change horses, she travelled on for about eleven hours, without accident or alarm, and between six or seven o'clock in the evening found herself entering Fullerton. A heroine, returning at the close of her career to her native village, in all the triumph of recovered reputation and all the dignity of a countess, with a long train of noble relations in their several phaetons, and three waiting-maids in a travelling chaise and four behind her, is an event on which the pen of the contriver might well delight to dwell. It gives credit to every conclusion, and the author must share in the glory that she so liberally bestows. But my affair is widely different. I bring back my heroine to her home in solitude and disgrace, and no sweet elation of spirits can lead me into minuteness. A heroine in a hack-post chaise is such a blow upon sentiment as no attempt at grandeur or pathos can withstand. Swiftly, therefore, shall her post-boy drive through the village amid the gaze of Sunday groups, and speedily shall be her descent from it. But whatever might be the distress of Catherine's mind as she thus advanced towards the parsonage, and whatever the humiliation of her biography in relating it, she was preparing enjoyment of no everyday nature for those to whom she went, first in the appearance of her carriage, and secondly in herself. The chaise of a traveller being a rare sight in Fullerton, the whole family were immediately at the window, and to have it stop at the sweep-gate was a pleasure to brighten every eye and occupy every fancy, a pleasure quite unlooked for by all but the two youngest children, a boy and girl of six and four years old, who expected a brother or sister in every carriage. Happy the glance that first distinguished Catherine, happy the voice that proclaimed the discovery, but whether such happiness were the lawful property of George or Harriet could never be exactly understood. Her father, mother, Sarah, George and Harriet, all assembled at the door to welcome her with affectionate eagerness, was a sight to awaken the best feelings of Catherine's heart, and in the embrace of each she stepped from the carriage. She found herself soothed before anything that she had believed possible. So surrounded, so caressed, she was even happy. In the joyfulness of family love, everything for a short time was subdued, and the pleasure of seeing her, leaving them at first little leisure for calm curiosity, they were all seated round the tea-table, which Mrs. Morland had hurried for the comfort of the poor traveller, whose pale and jaded look soon caught her notice, before any inquiry so direct as to a demand a positive answer was addressed to her. Reluctantly, and with much hesitation did she then begin what might perhaps, at the end of half an hour, be termed by the courtesy of the hearers an explanation. But scarcely within that time could they at all discover the cause or collect the particulars of her sudden return. They were far from being an irritable race, far from any quickness in catching or bitterness in resenting affronts. But here, when the whole was unfolded, was an insult not to be overlooked, nor for the first half-hour to be easily pardoned. 
Without suffering any romantic alarm in the consideration of their daughter's long and lonely journey, Mr and Mrs Morland could not but feel that it might have been productive of much unpleasantness to her, that it was what they could never have voluntarily suffered, and that in forcing her on such a measure, General Tilney had acted neither honourably nor feelingly, neither as a gentleman nor as a parent. Why he had done it, what could have provoked him to such a breach of hospitality, and so suddenly turned all his partial regard for their daughter into actual ill-will, was a matter which they were at least as far from divining as Catherine herself. But it did not oppress them by any means so long, and after a due course of useless conjecture that it was a strange business, and that he must be a very strange man, grew enough for all then indignation and wonder. Sarah, indeed, still indulged in the sweets of incomprehensibility, exclaiming and conjecturing with youthful ardour. "'My dear, you give yourself a great deal of needless trouble,' said her mother at last. "'Depend upon it. It is something not at all worth understanding.' "'I can allow for his wishing Catherine away when he recollected this engagement,' said Sarah. "'But why not do it civilly?' "'I am very sorry for the young people,' returned Mrs. Morland. "'They must have a sad time of it. "'But as for anything else, it's no matter now. "'Catherine is safe at home, and our comfort does not depend on General Tilney.' "'Catherine sighed. "'Well,' continued her philosophical mother, "'I'm glad I did not know of your journey at the time, "'but now it is all over, perhaps there's no great harm done. "'It is always good for young people to be put upon exerting themselves. "'And you know, my dear Catherine, "'you always were a sad little shatter-brained creature. "'But now you must have been forced to have your wits about you, "'with so much changing of chaises and so forth, "'and I hope it will appear that you have not left anything behind you "'in any of the pockets.' "'Catherine hoped so too, and tried to feel an interest in her own amendment.' But her spirits were quite worn down, and to be silent and alone becoming soon her only wish, she readily agreed to her mother's next counsel of going early to bed. Her parents, seeing nothing in her ill looks and agitation but the natural consequences of mortified feelings and the unusual exertions and fatigue of such a journey, parted from her without any doubt of their being soon slept away and though when they all met the next morning her recovery was not equal to their hopes, they were still perfectly unsuspicious of there being any deeper evil. They never once thought of her heart, which for the parents of a young lady of seventeen, just returned from her first excursion from home, was odd enough. As soon as breakfast was over, she sat down to fulfil her promise to Miss Tilney, whose trust in the effect of time and distance on her friend's disposition was already justified for already did Catherine reproach herself with having parted from Eleanor coldly, with having neither enough value to her merits or kindness, and never enough commiserated her for what she had been yesterday left to endure. The strength of these feelings, however, was far from assisting her pen, and never had it been harder for her to write than in addressing Eleanor Tilney, to compose a letter which might at once do justice to her sentiments and her situation, convey gratitude without servile regret, be guarded without coldness, and honest without resentment, a letter which Eleanor might not be pained by the perusal of, and above all which she might not blush herself if Henry should chance to see it, was an undertaking to frighten away all her powers of performance, and after long thought and much perplexity, to be very brief was all that she could determine on with any confidence of safety. The money, therefore, which Eleanor had advanced, was enclosed with little more than grateful thanks and the thousand good wishes of a most affectionate heart. "'This has been a strange acquaintance,' observed Mrs. Morland as the letter was finished. "'Soon made and soon ended. I am sorry it happened so, for Mrs. Allen thought them a very pretty kind of young people, and you were sadly out of luck too in your Isabella. The oh, poor James! Well, we must live and learn.' and the next new friends you make, I hope, will be better worth keeping. Catherine coloured as she warmly answered, No friend can be better worth keeping than Eleanor. If so, my dear, I dare say you will meet again some time or other. Do not be uneasy. It is ten to one, but you are thrown together in the course of a few years, and then what a pleasure it will be. Mrs. Morland was not happy in her attempt at consolation, 
The hope of meeting again in the course of a few years could only put into Catherine's head what might happen in that time to make the meeting dreadful to her. She could never forget Henry Tilney, nor think of him with less tenderness than she did at that moment, that he might forget her, and in that case to meet. Her eyes filled with tears as she pictured her acquaintance so renewed, and her mother, perceiving her comfortable suggestions to have had no good effect, proposed, as another expedient for restoring her spirits, that they should call on Mrs. Allen. The two houses were only a quarter of a mile apart, and as they walked, Mrs. Morland quickly dispatched all that she felt on the score of James's disappointment. "'We are sorry for him,' said she, "'but otherwise there's no harm done in the match going off, "'for it could not be a desirable thing to have him engaged to a girl "'whom we had not the smallest acquaintance with, "'and who was so entirely without fortune. "'And now, after such behaviour, we cannot think at all well of her. "'Just at present it comes hard to poor James, "'but that will not last for ever.' and I dare say he will be a discreeter man all his life for the foolishness of his first choice. This was just such a summary view of the affair as Catherine could listen to. Another sentence might have endangered her complacence, and made her reply less rational, for soon were all her thinking powers swallowed up in the reflection of her own change of feelings and spirits since she last had trodden that well-known road. It was not three months ago, since wild with joyful expectation she had there run backwards and forwards some ten times a day, with a heart light, gay and independent, looking forward to pleasures untasted and unalloyed, and free from the apprehension of evil as from the knowledge of it. Three months ago I had seen her all this, and now how altered a being did she return? She was received by the Allens with all the kindness which her unlooked-for appearance, acting on steady affection, would naturally call forth. A great was their surprise, and warm their displeasure on hearing how she had been treated, though Mrs. Morland's account of it was no inflated representation, no steady appeal to their passions. "'Catherine took us quite by surprise yesterday evening,' said she. "'She travelled all the way post by herself, and knew nothing of coming till Saturday night. The General Tilney, for some odd fancy or other, all of a sudden grew tired of having her there, and almost turned her out of the house. Very unfriendly!' "'Certainly, and he must be a very odd man. "'But we're so glad to have her amongst us again. "'And it's a great comfort to find that she is not a poor helpless creature, "'but can shift very well for herself.' "'Mr. Allen expressed himself on the occasion "'with the reasonable resentment of a sensible friend, "'and Mrs. Allen thought his expression quite good enough "'to be immediately made use of again by herself. "'His wonder, his conjectures, his explanations "'became in succession hers,' with the addition of this single remark, I really have not the patience with the general, to fill up every accidental pause, and I really have not patience with the general, was uttered twice after Mr. Allen left the room, without any relaxation of anger or any material digression of thought. A more considerable degree of wandering attended a third re repetition, and after completing the fourth, she immediately added, only think, my dear, of my having got that frightful great rent in my best mechlin so charmingly mended before I left Bath that one can hardly see where it was. I must show it to you some day or other. Bath is a nice place, Catherine, after all. I assure you I did not above half like coming away. Mrs. Thorpe's being there was such a comfort to us, was not it? You know you and I were quite forlorn at first. Yes, but that did not last long said Catherine, her eyes brightening at the recollection of what had first given spirit to her existence. Very true. We soon met with Mrs. Thorpe, and then we wanted for nothing. My dear, do you not think these silk gloves wear very well? I put them on new the first time of our going to the lower rooms, you know, and I've worn them a great deal since. Do you remember that evening? Do I? Oh, perfectly. It was very agreeable, was it not? Mr. Tilney drank tea with us, I always thought him a great addition. He is so very agreeable. I have a notion you danced with him, but I'm not quite sure. I remember I had my favourite gown on. Catherine could not answer, and after a short trial of other subjects, Mrs. Allen again returned to, I really have not patience with the general. Such an agreeable, worthy man as he seemed to be. I do not suppose, Mrs. Morland, you ever saw a better-bred man in your life. His lodgings were taken the very day after he left them, Catherine. But no wonder, Milsom Street, you know. 
As they walked home again, Mrs Morland endeavoured to impress upon her daughter's mind the happiness of having such steady well-wishers as Mr and Mrs Allen, and the very little consideration which the neglect or unkindness of slight acquaintance like the Tilneys ought to have with her while she could preserve the good opinion and affection of her earliest friends. There was a great deal of good sense in all this, but there are some situations of the human mind in which good sense has very little power, and Catherine's feelings contradicted almost every position her mother advanced. It was upon the behaviour of those very slight acquaintance that all her present happiness depended, and while Mrs Morland was successfully confirming her own opinions by the justness of her own representations, Catherine was silently reflecting that now Henry must have arrived at Northanger, now he must have heard of her departure, and now, perhaps, they were all setting off for Hereford. Poor Catherine, right? Yeah. Yeah. We knew there had to be a crisis, right? There has to be some kind of conflict, some kind of crisis, a climax to the drama. The thing that I think is most interesting about what Jane Austen has done here also is that she has actually given us a gothic moment where it's a mystery. We don't know why she's being sent away. We don't know what's going on. And we are treated to at the end of, well, no, towards, towards the end of the first chapter, while Catherine is learning all of this and, and readying herself to leave, the weather is quite gothic and she is absolutely unmoved by it. So instead of dwelling in the, oh, I'm living a drama now and oh, the setting that I happen to be in is gothic, she's being a real person dealing with a real situation that is just awful. So that is a little interesting. I find I found that to be kind of awesome. Yay, Jane Austen. The other thing that I thought was pretty interesting in the first of the two chapters that we did was Eleanor's shame at not being the master of her own domain or mistress of her own domain, that her father is deciding everything, even though as the only adult-ish woman of the household, she should be the one who is determining how guests are treated. She is not able to perform that duty because her father is usurping that duty from her. That said, Jane Austen, as good as she is at being funny and having a light touch and getting her timings right and treatment of horses correct as she writes these books, she also understands money in a way that perhaps other writers of the time didn't. And I thought it was really telling when Eleanor offers Catherine money to get home. The difficulty of having that conversation shouldn't be passed over. The difficulty of the situation they are putting Catherine in should not be passed over either. For Catherine to be sent out without any servant, a manservant, anyone from the house accompanying her, she expected that they would at least accompany her halfway, get her you know, close enough to home that she's familiar with the terrain, but she doesn't even get that. It, it really was unsafe still for especially a young woman, a young untested woman, to travel 70 miles by herself. Jane Austen clearly decided that that was not going to be part of the crisis, was something bad happening to Catherine on the journey. And thank goodness, because I don't think I could have handled that. Nor could Eleanor, I'm sure, if she had heard about it afterwards. But this really is scandalous, what General Tilney has done. And of course, we don't know why. And the other thing is, by her saying in the second chapter we, we listened to today, that Catherine traveled on for about 11 hours without accident or alarm, that indicates that she was probably not stopping to eat. She was probably just letting them switch the horses, getting back in and getting gone. She may have had snacks along the way, but she didn't really get a decent meal. And she certainly didn't eat breakfast either. So this has been 
an unpleasant journey in many, many ways for the poor girl. And so we end with poor Catherine recognizing the fact that by this point in time, Henry has probably gotten home, found out that she has gone, and he and his family are heading off to this quote unquote air quotes here previous engagement that General Tilney had just, you know, forgotten about, which sounds so like him. <sighs> and that's a, a hard place for her to be. Switching back to her normal life at this point for her is not going to be easy. Mrs. Allen is still Mrs. Allen. Uh, everything comes down to a question of fashion and fabric, which of course is how we met Henry Tilney in the first place, as he was a connoisseur of fine muslin. But this is, this is hard. This is, this is Catherine growing up. And so now in the last set of chapters, next week, we will get to see how she does the growing up and how she's turned out. And with that, I'm going to leave you. However, I'm going to play you out with several voicemails. You will hear first from Jessica, who has an app to share and a YouTube video to share. Everything she mentions is linked out to in the show notes. And then you'll hear from Tara, and she mentions a YouTube channel as well. I found the video she is talking about, and that is also linked to from the show notes for you. And I think that's it. All right, let's listen to our voicemails. And as always, be well, take care of yourself, take care of each other, wear your mask, get a vaccine. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hey guys, this is Jessica. It's been quite a while since I left a comment and I'm just catching up on Northanger Abbey and I wanted to share two bits of information. The first is a really cool app called Seek, S-E-E-K. And it is a great free app that you can use to identify different plants and animals. I use it frequently on insects to tell whether or not that spider is poisonous or not. And my little cousin loves to use it to go out and identify the different mushrooms that are growing in her yard. Her favorite is dog vomit slime mold. Yes, that exists. Um, the other bit of information I wanted to share with the listeners is a YouTube channel. The other free thing that I wanted to share with you guys is a YouTube channel by Dr. Octavia Cox, C-O-X. She has some really great videos where she explores classic literature and really breaks down the text. The one I wanted to share with you was about did John Thorpe propose, and that was really eye-opening, the way that that scene could be read both as a proposal and as completely not a proposal. So go check it out. Free app, free YouTube vid channel. It was awesome. Hello, Heather. It is Tara Worcester, and I have some Harry Potter movie trivia knowledge for you. Did you know that the scene when Harry first encounters Diagon Alley, they actually only use the same, like, what was it, like, 10 feet of set. But if you watch carefully, you see the same witches pawing through the dried flowers in every single angle of that scene that's shot there whenever Hagrid is walking Harry down the Diagon Alley. You see it, like, 11 times or something like that. It's hilarious. I found it on Pinterest via Tumblr via Reddit. And, like, you can see they, they screenshot every time the same witches are pawing through the cart of flowers. It was so funny. And my other piece of knowledge for you is you can eat honeysuckle flowers. Go back. Go back to Honeysuckle Road and pick, like, a third of them and eat them. You can eat the nectar on honey, uh, honeysuckle flowers. But don't eat the berries because they're poisonous to everybody. But, yes, you can eat the honeysuckle flowers. The nectar is very, very sweet. So I'm at the part in the chapter where they're visiting the son's house. Catherine commented on the one room where you could see the cottage to the apple tree up the window and how, why isn't this room made up yet? And it's perfect for this, that, and the other. And, well, yes, if it was made up to a lady's taste. And the general was asking her, um recommendations 
I kid you not. I have lived this moment in my life. Oh, my goodness. I was in high school. The boyfriend I had at the time was working with his dad to fix up part of his workshop. was in this big warehouse-style building. And I was like, oh, you can do this over here and that over there. And, hey, you should put this in this place here. And then you can build this thing for this thing and have storage over here and da 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 rattling on like a lunatic because, you know, oh, there's so much opportunity and I'm such a people pleaser and let me help you finish this thing and, oh, yay, your life is so much easier because that's the kind of person I am. And the dad goes, oh, really? And poignantly does a slow turn to the sun with that, please, by all the gods, make this woman my daughter-in-law so that she can help me do this because she's a genius. And the boyfriend at the time turned 17 shades of embarrassed and proceeded to clam up like an idiot, which, of course, that's exactly what I did because the boyfriend was embarrassed because I had embarrassed him, so therefore I was embarrassed. And I said nothing else for the next eight hours I was with them working in this warehouse shed. And it's one of those, oh, I have lived <laughs> that embarrassment. And I had to share. <laughs> Hi, Heather. It's Tara again. I remembered something I meant to tell you about last week, but I totally forgot because chaos. Um, directions on letters. Um, you were talking about how they would be folded very small and usually wrapped up in a string, and then the string knot would be sealed so you could see if it was open. If you want to see a demonstration of this, Morgan Donner on YouTube, she does 15th century and slash medieval uh, garment recreation and she has this adorable ribbon tied hair and she's amazing for costume secret Santa I want to say it was 2019 I could be wrong she made a mulled wine spice mix to send to Kathy Hay also on YouTube she's amazing she's currently endeavoring to create worse peacock dress for the Princess of India, it's amazing. She wrote, Morgan wrote Kathy a letter and sealed it in the way you're describing. She also did a very beautiful cloth, wax, and string seal on the mold spice wine mix as well. So if you want a demonstration of that, you can go watch Morgan's content for the 2019 Cost Tube Secret Santa Exchange. And consuming Morgan Donner's content in general is delightfully relaxing, and you all of a sudden want to put ribbons in your hair and throw off all of your elastics and make yourself amazing garments out of beautiful wool and then go frolic in a field and go do, uh, what is it, SEA reenacting? She's amazing. Go watch her. She's currently in the middle of a move, so she's not posting content as much right now. But uh, she did post a video recently where she went to go see these potters, more pottery, who recreate ancient designs on their pots. Uh, the one that Morgan was getting replaced was actually a recreation of a 15th century pattern. That's a really beautiful it's reds and whites and blues and blacks. So Morgan Donner for ribbon and ink, uh, ribbon and wax sealed letters, and Kathy Hay for very soft spoken motivation content as well. Episode five hundred and sixty one: Satirizing History. are you? I am well. I have had a whole week without work and have accomplished very little. <laughs> I have been moving slowly. You know, it's that paradox of when you are very busy, you can get an awful lot done. And when you are not so much the busy, you are not so much the efficient at getting things done. But I have made some headway with the basement and organizing it in a way that it resembles the deck of the enterprise <laughs> in that from a place 
a single place where one spends most of one's time, one can reach everything one needs in order to do what one wants to do. So I have a, a desk space with the computer, but the computer is also the place where I get tutorials or watch how-to videos or take classes. And so I also need to have access at that desk to certain things. I also have a big folding table that we put out in the room for larger art things and like a, a cutting mat for fabric, things like that. So that's a different set of, I need to be able to reach things in order to be efficient area. And, you know, figuring out how to orchestrate that in a basement with no walls upon which anything can be hung because <laughs> it's just cinder block. It's not a finished basement. Uh, it makes things interesting. So trying to be creative in the ways of the organizing has been uh, the bulk of my, my week. Big congratulations to my mom, who is actually, she has said it out loud and in front of other people, she's retiring. Nobody actually believes this, but she's retiring enough that she'll be able to go to Ireland with us this, this fall, which I'm very excited about. On the, my previous work front, I don't know if you saw the news report, listener Carmen, who comes to Thursday night chats, who always has the best books to share. In fact, I need to share with you the name of the book she mentioned last night, which is The Postscript Murders by Ellie Griffiths. This will be my next foray, I think, into uh, fun after I finish. I've finished Amelia Peabody, so of course I'm in mourning. I read all of them, all, all, all of them. I'm heartbroken that there aren't more because I'm greedy. <laughs> <laughs> I've switched to Vicky Bliss, which uh, the first Vicky Bliss book I could have easily skipped. The second one got better. The third one is considerably better. I am probably going to finish them all just because I can. I've been using Hoopla to listen to audiobooks for free and have been lucky because they have had all the ones that I've wanted so far. However, Carmen last night shared the fact that in Florida, there was in the news a, a particular office that had COVID sweep through. And it was a very telling and unfortunate, very unfortunate experiment in masking and vaccinations. And if you didn't see the news report, it goes something like this. One guy in the IT department caught COVID from someone outside of the office from, uh, I think it was actually from a different county, brought it back with him, infected several people in the IT department, two of whom died rather rapidly, three of whom were very sick. One or all of them may have been hospitalized. Once they started showing symptoms, they stopped coming to work. Now, once you start showing symptoms, you've been infectious for at least two days. This is what makes this whole disease so insidious, is that you're spreading it before you know you have it. Plus, of course, there's the problem with people being asymptomatic carriers, like Typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid. So here, the thing that was most important was that as the disease went from person to person within this IT department, eventually it got to the one person in the IT department who was vaccinated and it stopped there and nobody else in the office got it. This is what stops mutations from happening. Whether the barrier to transmission is our behavior because we are wearing a mask, washing our hands, uh, staying at least six feet away from people who aren't wearing masks, or whether the barrier is your body is carrying antibodies because you got a vaccine. Either way, stopping the transmission is what stops mutations from happening. So until people are all vaccinated or all learn to behave themselves, the longer transmissions go on for, the more variants we will get. And every time there's a new variant, there is the risk of that variant having some 
minor property change that starts the whole thing over again. Just like making a cassette tape copy. We were talking about this last night too. Just like making a cassette tape copy in the old days, if you got a mixtape and you made a copy of that mixtape for a friend, and then that friend made a copy of the mixtape for their friend, each time you copy it, you introduce the opportunity for there to be some amount of degradation, some amount of change in the quality of the audio. It is the same for cells, for viruses, for anything that replicates itself. Every time it replicates, there is the possibility of a chance change. And the worst case scenario is that we wind up with a variant that truly is uh, more dangerous and that the vaccines don't work well enough against. Uh, another reminder, the vaccine does not mean you will not get COVID. Just like getting a flu shot does not mean you will not get the flu. What it does mean is that you won't die. What a flu shot means is you won't wind up like I did, very nearly hospitalized with really bad pneumonia. You will merely feel lousy for a few days, but it won't kill you. And that's our goal. We know the disease is going to spread. There is no 100% solution to not spreading it. We want to limit the spread. We want to keep you from dying. So if you haven't gotten a vaccine yet, please, please, please find a list to get on. Find a place you can go to. If you are in the States, go to another state if you have to. I certainly had to at the time because Pennsylvania was very slow with its, its rollout. I know that there are plenty of countries right now that don't have easy access to vaccines and people are doing everything they can to rectify that situation as well. I believe Biden spent a bunch of money on vaccines that are being shared with other countries and I hope they get to you as soon as possible. But boy, get yourself on a list. If you can't get the vaccine yet, at least find a way to do that because I I don't want to hear sad stories about anyone who listens to the podcast. That would make me very sad. But on to happier things, like Northanger Abbey. Although it is the end of Northanger Abbey, I do have a surprise for you at the end of listening to the chapters today. So I at least can hold that carrot out for you, even though we are ending this marvelous and fun book. Some things to know. Most of what I have for you today comes after, not surprisingly. But before we start the chapters, a couple of things to know. We ended our previous section with Catherine being home. She is not a particularly happy camper, but she is at least home and safe. Her mother is going to mention The Mirror. The Mirror was the name of a periodical that was circulating at the time. And she is actually referring to a real, well, most likely referring to a real article that was a, a fictitious letter, not a satiric one. It comes across as being kind of satiric to me, but it is a fictitious letter that was written in 1779 from John Homespun. That's how you know it's fictitious. And the title of it was The Consequence to Little Folks of intimacy with great ones. And it's all about how it's not so good for the poor relations to go and spend some time with the wealthy relations because you get some highfalutin ideas about things. And, and he goes on to say, a month of staying with a great lady had corrupted his daughters, inspiring dissipated habits, use of fashionable French terms, this is where it gets funny, religious doubts, and a general contempt for the humble means and customs of their own family. It's hard to tell from that <laughs> the fashionable French terms if this was completely tongue-in-cheek or if it was really a complaint. It could have been either one. I haven't been able to find a copy of it. But that is what Mrs. Moreland will be referring to. You'll hear the word uncandid. Uncandid doesn't mean in this case what we would think it to mean. In this case, uncandid means unfriendly or un unfavorable, not dishonest or 
you know, when you're being candid, you're being open, you're being honest. This is a little bit different. So when you hear uncandid, think unfriendly. You will hear Jane Austen using the word sinking. And I am finding no references to that term being used as a a known form of slang at the time. I cannot imagine that it's not a slang term, or it's at least a term that's being used in a slangy fashion. The phrase that you'll hear it used in is sinking half the children, which is pretty much exactly what it might bring to mind, that if you were, for example, to throw a bunch of children in a bag and throw them overboard with a brick in there, it's a horrifying idea. It's a horrifying term. It is not being used as a real statement. It is, it is a horrifying metaphor for eliminating half the children from a story or from a conversation that you're having. You just throw them out of the boat. You're not going to pay any attention to them. They don't exist. The way Jane Austen uses it and the the context in which she uses the term is very funny, I think, because of who is saying it and how appalling the statement is. I cannot believe that Jane Austen is not using that as a slang term coming out of this person's mouth. A term that I have not come across before, rhodomontade, which means being overly braggadocious, saying all sorts of awesome things about yourself, is a rhodomontade. It's R-H-O-D-O-M-O-N-T-A-D-E. Marvelous word. I'm going to have to try and find ways to work that into conversation (laughs) casually. (laughs) Necessitous is what it sounds like. It's just being needy. It's just used kind of oddly in a sentence and it stuck out at me. So necessitous is needy. Forward is being pushy or presumptuous. And then we have a, a couple of situational complexities. When two young people of means got married, we know that there's this whole thing about how much money the girl is bringing to the relationship, how much money the guy is bringing to the relationship. For the the woman, it's her her dowry. One of the things that conscientious fathers of means would have done as well would be to have established, okay, there's this much money of that principle. This is how much they are going to be expected to live on. And of that principle, this is how it will be divided amongst the children that are expected to appear. So someone who is a second son, for example, like in our case, we know that would be Henry Tilney, a second son would be expected in a a well-to-do family, would be expected to have a certain amount of money that is contractually available to him upon marriage, because that would have been set up actually by the kid's grandfather. So General Tilney wouldn't have been the one to have made that decision. That contract would have been settled by his father and his father-in-law upon his marriage to Mrs. Tilney. I don't think we've ever had a, a story in all these 15 years where that was dealt with up front quite so clearly as it is, well, it's as clearly as it's alluded to here. So I thought that was kind of interesting too, because I've always wondered about that. And it, it also means that since it was stipulated by General Tierney's marriage contract, basically, it's not something that he can change or alter. Just like we've had situations where there's an entailment on the property and there's nothing that can be done about it. A quick reminder about peerage and rankings. The fifth and last of the peers would be a baron. The fourth from the bottom would be a viscount. Viscount and viscountess would be referred to as Lord, female, Viscountess would be referred to as your ladyship. So that you're going to come across today. And that is all the things I have for you before we dive into our final, our final two chapters. So we have chapters 30 and 31 of Northanger Abbey, 
written by Jane Austen and read for us by the fabulous Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 30 Catherine's disposition was not naturally sedentary, nor had her habits been ever very industrious. But whatever might hitherto have been her defects of that sort, her mother could not but perceive them now to be greatly increased. She could neither sit still nor employ herself for ten minutes together, walking round the garden and orchard again and again, as if nothing but motion was voluntary, and seemed as if she could even walk about the house rather than remain fixed for any time in the parlour. Her loss of spirits was a yet greater alteration. In her rambling and her idleness she might only be a caricature of herself, but in her silence and sadness she was the very reverse of all that she had been before. For two days Mrs. Morland allowed it to pass, even without a hint, but when a third night's rest had neither restored her cheerfulness, improved her in useful activity, nor given her a greater inclination for needlework, she could no longer refrain from the gentle reproof of, "'My dear Catherine, I am afraid you are growing quite a fine lady. I do not know when poor Richard's cravats would be done, if he had no friend but you. Your head runs too much upon Bath. But there is a time for everything, a time for balls and plays, and a time for work. You have had a long run of amusement, and now you must try to be useful.' Catherine took up her work directly, saying in a dejected voice that her head did not run upon Bath much. "'Then you're fretting about General Tilney, and that is very simple of you. For ten to one, whether you ever see him again, you should never fret about trifles.' After a short silence, "'I hope, my Catherine, you're not getting out of humour with home, because it's not so grand as Northanger. That will be turning your visit into an evil indeed.' Wherever you are, you should always be contented, but especially at home, because there you must spend the most of your time. I did not quite like at breakfast to hear you talk so much about the French bread at Northanger. I'm sure I do not care about the bread. It's all the same to me what I eat. There is a very clever essay in one of the books upstairs upon such a subject, about young girls who have been spoilt for home by great acquaintance. The mirror, I think— I will look it out for you some day or other, because I'm sure it will do you good. Catherine said no more, and, with an endeavour to do right, applied to her work, but after a few minutes sunk again, without knowing it, herself, into languor and listlessness, moving herself in her chair, for the irritation of weariness much oftener than she moved her needle. Mrs. Morland watched the progress of this relapse, and seeing in her daughter's absent and dissatisfied look a full proof of that repining spirit to which she had now begun to attribute her want of cheerfulness, hastily left the room to fetch the book in question, anxious to lose no time in attacking so dreadful a malady. It was some time before she could find what she looked for, and other family matters occurring to detain her, a quarter of an hour at her lap ere she returned downstairs with the volume, from which so much was hoped. Her avocations above, having shut out all noise but what she created herself, she knew not that a visitor had arrived within the last few minutes, till, on entering the room, the first object she beheld was a young man whom she had never met before. With a look of much respect, he immediately rose, and being introduced to her by her conscious daughter as Mr. Henry Tilney, with the embarrassment of real sensibility, began to apologise for his appearance there, acknowledging that after what had passed he had little right to expect a welcome at Fullerton, and stating his impatience to be assured of Miss Morland's having reached her home in safety as the cause of the intrusion. He did not address himself to an uncandid judge or a resentful heart. Far from comprehending him or his sister in their father's misconduct, Mrs. Morland had always been kindly disposed towards each, and instantly, pleased by his appearance, received him with the simple professions of unaffected benevolence, thanking him for such an attention to her daughter, assuring him that the friends of her children were always welcome there, and entreating him to say not another word of the past. He was not ill-inclined to obey this request, for though his heart was greatly relieved by such unlooked-for mildness, it was not just at that moment in his power to say anything to the purpose. Returning in silence to his seat, therefore, he remained for some minutes most civilly answering all Mrs. Morland's common remarks about the weather and roads. 
Catherine, meanwhile, the anxious, agitated, happy, feverish Catherine, said not a word, but her glowing cheek and brightened eye made her mother trust that this good-natured visit would at least set her heart at ease for a time, and gladly, therefore, did she lay aside the first volume of the mirror for a future hour. Desirous of Mr. Morland's assistance, as well in giving encouragement as finding conversation for her guest, whose embarrassment on his father's account she earnestly pitied, Mrs. Morland had very early dispatched one of the children to summon him. But Mr. Morland was from home, and being thus without any support at the end of quarter of an hour, she had nothing to say. After a couple of minutes and broken silence, Henry, turning to Catherine for the first time since her mother's entrance, asked her with sudden alacrity if Mr. and Mrs. Allen were now at Fullerton, and on developing from amidst all her perplexity of words in reply the meaning which one short syllable would have given, immediately expressed his intentions of paying his respects to them, and with a rising colour asked if she would have the goodness to show him the way. "'You may see the house from this window, sir,' was information on Sarah's side which produced only a bow of acknowledgment from the gentleman, and a silencing nod from her mother. For Mrs. Morland, thinking it probable as a secondary consideration in his wish of waiting on their worthy neighbours, that he might have some explanation to give of his father's behaviour, which it must be more pleasant for him to communicate only to Catherine, would not on any account prevent her accompanying him. They began their walk, and Mrs. Morland was not entirely mistaken in his object of wishing it. Some explanation on his father's account he had to give, but his first purpose was to explain himself, and before they reached Mr. Allen's grounds he had done it so well that Catherine did not think it could ever be repeated too often. She was assured of his affection, and that heart in return was solicited, which perhaps they pretty equally knew was already entirely his own, for though Henry was now sincerely attached to her, though he felt and delighted in all the excellencies of her character, and truly loved her society, I must confess that his affection originated in nothing better than gratitude, or in other words, that a persuasion of her partiality for him had been the only cause of giving her a serious thought. It is a new circumstance in romance, I acknowledge, and dreadfully derogatory of a heroine's dignity, but if it be as new in common life, the credit of a wild imagination will at least be all my own. A very short visit to Mrs. Allen, in which Henry talked at random without sense or connection, and Catherine, wrapped in the contemplation of her own unutterable happiness, scarcely opened her lips, dismissed them to the ecstasies of another tete-a-tete, -tete. and before it was suffered to close, she was enabled to judge how far he was sanctioned by parental authority in his present application. On his return from Woodston two days before, he had been met near the Abbey by his impatient father, hastily informed in angry terms of Miss Morland's departure, and ordered to think of her no more. Such was the permission upon which he had now offered her his hand. The affrighted Catherine, amidst all the terrors of expectation, as she listened to this account, could not but rejoice in the kind caution with which Henry had saved her from the necessity of a conscious rejection, by engaging her faith before he mentioned the subject, and as he proceeded to give the particulars and to explain the motives of his father's conduct, her feelings soon hardened into an even triumphant delight. The general had had nothing to accuse her of, nothing to lay to her charge, but her being the involuntary, unconscious object of a deception which his pride could not pardon, and which better pride would have been ashamed to own. She was guilty only of being less rich than he had supposed her to be. Under a mistaken persuasion of her possessions and claims had he courted her acquaintance in Bath, solicited her company at Northanger, and designed her for his daughter-in-law. On discovering his error, to turn her from the house seemed the best, though to his feelings an inadequate proof of his resentment towards her and his contempt of her family. John Thorpe had first misled him. The general, perceiving his son one night at the theatre to be paying considerable attention to Miss Morland, had accidentally inquired of Thorpe if he knew more of her than her name. Thorpe, most happy to be on speaking terms with a man of General Tilney's importance, had been joyfully and proudly communicative, and been at that time not only in daily expectation of Morland's engaging Isabella, 
but likewise pretty well resolved upon marrying Catherine himself, his vanity induced him to represent the family as yet more wealthy than his vanity and avarice had made him believe them. With whomsoever he was or was likely to be connected, his own consequence always required that theirs should be great, and as his intimacy with any acquaintance grew, so regularly grew their fortune. The expectations of his friend Morland, therefore, from the first overrated, had ever since his introduction to Isabella been gradually increasing, and by merely adding twice as much for the grandeur of the moment, by doubling what he chose to think the amount of Mr Morland's preferment, trebling his private fortune, bestowing a rich aunt and sinking half the children, he was able to represent the whole family to the general in the most respectable light. For Catherine, however, the peculiar object of the general's curiosity and his own speculations, he had yet something bore in reserve, and the ten or fifteen thousand pounds which her father could give her would be a pretty addition to Mr. Allen's estate. Her intimacy there had made him seriously determined on her being handsomely legacied hereafter, and to speak of her, therefore, as the most acknowledged future heiress of Fullerton naturally followed. Upon such intelligence the general had proceeded, for never had it occurred to him to doubt its authority. Thorpe's interest in the family by his sister's approaching connection with one of its members and his own views on another, circumstances of which he boasted with almost equal openness, seemed sufficient vouchers for its truth, and to these were added the absolute facts of the Allens being wealthy and childless, and of Miss Morland being under their care and as soon as his acquaintance allowed him to judge of their treating her with parental kindness. His resolution was soon formed. Already had he discerned a liking towards Miss Morland in the countenance of his son, and thankful for Mr Thorpe's communication, he almost instantly determined to spare no pains in weakening his boasted interest and ruining his dearest hopes. Catherine herself could not be more ignorant at the time of all this than his own children. Henry and Eleanor perceiving nothing in her situation likely to engage their father's particular respect, had seen with astonishment the suddenness, continuance and extent of his attention, and though latterly from some hints which had accompanied an almost positive command to his son of doing everything in his power to attach her, Henry was convinced of his father's believing it to be an advantageous connection. It was not till the late explanation at Northanger that they had the smallest idea of the false calculation which had hurried him on. That they were false, the general had learned from the very person who had suggested them, from Thorpe himself, who he had chanced to meet again in town, and who, under the influence of exactly the opposite feelings, irritated by Catherine's refusal, and yet more by the failure of a very recent endeavour to accomplish a reconciliation between Morland and Isabella, convinced that they were separated for ever and spurning a friendship which could no longer be serviceable, hastened to contradict all that he had said before to the advantage of the Morlands, confessed himself to have been totally mistaken in his opinion of their circumstance and character, misled by the rodomontade of his friend to believe his father a man of substance and credit, whereas the transactions of the two or three last weeks proved him to be neither, for after coming eagerly forward on the first overture of a marriage between the families with the most liberal proposals, he had, on being brought to the point by the shrewdness of the relator, been constrained to acknowledge himself incapable of giving the young people even a decent support. They were, in fact, a necessitous family, numerous too, almost beyond example, and by no means respected in their own neighbourhood, as he had lately had particular opportunities of discovering, aiming at a style of life which their fortune could not warrant, seeking to better themselves by wealthy connections, a forward, bragging, scheming race. The terrified general pronounced the name of Allen with an inquiring look, and here too Thorpe had learned his error. The Allens, he believed, had lived near them too long, and he knew the young man on whom the Fullerton's estate must devolve. The general needed no more. Enraged with almost everybody in the world but himself, he set out the next day for the Abbey, where his performances had been seen. I leave it to my reader's sagacity to determine how much of all this was possible for Henry to communicate at this time to Catherine, how much of it he could have learned from his father, in what points his own conjectures might assist him, and what portion must yet remain to be told in a letter from James. I have united for their ease what they must divide for mine. 
Catherine, at any rate, heard enough to feel that in suspecting General Selney of either murdering or shutting up his wife, she had scarcely sinned against his character or magnified his cruelty. Henry, in having such things to relate of his father, was almost as pitiable as in their first avowal to himself. He blushed for the narrow-minded counsel which he was obliged to expose. The conversation between them at Northanger had been of the most unfriendly kind. Henry's indignation on hearing how Catherine had been treated on comprehending his father's views and being ordered to acquiesce in them had been open and bold. The general, accustomed on every ordinary occasion to give the law in his family, prepared for no reluctance but of feeling, no opposing desire that should dare to clothe itself in words, could ill brook the opposition of his son, steadily as the sanction of reason and the dictate of conscience could make it. But in such a cause, his anger, though it must shock, could not intimidate Henry, who was sustained in his purpose by a conviction of its justice. He felt himself bound, as much in honour as in affection to Miss Morland, and believing that heart to be his own which he had been directed to gain, no unworthy retraction of a tacit consent, no reversing decree of unjustifiable anger could shake his fidelity, or influence the resolutions it prompted. He steadily refused to accompany his father to Herefordshire, an engagement formed almost at the moment to promote the dismissal of Catherine, and, as steadily, declared his intention of offering her his hand. The general was furious in his anger, and they parted in dreadful disagreement. Henry, in an agitation of mind which many solitary hours were required to compose, had returned almost instantly to Woodston, and on the afternoon of the following day had begun his journey to Fullerton. Chapter 31 Mr. and Mrs. Morland's surprise on being applied to by Mr. Tilney for their consent to his marrying their daughter was for a few minutes considerable, it having never entered their heads to suspect an attachment on either side. But as nothing after all could be more natural than Catherine's being beloved, they soon learnt to consider it with only the happy agitation of gratified pride, and as far as they alone were concerned, had not a single objection to start. His pleasing manners and good sense were self-evident recommendations, and having never heard evil of him, it was not their way to suppose any evil could be told. Goodwill supplying the place of experience, his character needed no attestation. Catherine would make a sad, heedless young housekeeper, to be sure, was her mother's foreboding remark, but quick was the consolation of there being nothing like practice. There was but one obstacle, in short, to be mentioned— but till that one was removed it must be impossible for them to sanction the engagement. Their tempers were mild, but their principles were steady, and while his parents so expressly forbade the connection, they could not allow themselves to encourage it. That the general should come forward to solicit the alliance, or that he should even very heartily approve it, they were not refined enough to make any parading stipulation, but the decent appearance of consent must be yielded, and that once obtained— and their own hearts made them trust that it could not be very long denied. Their willing approbation was instantly to follow. His consent was all that they wished for. They were no more inclined than entitled to demand his money. Of a very considerable fortune, his son was by marriage settlements eventually secure. His present income was an income of independence and comfort, and under every pecuniary view it was a match beyond the claims of their daughter. The young people could not be surprised at a decision like this. They felt and they deplored, but they could not resent it, and they parted, endeavouring to hope that such a change in the general, as each believed almost impossible, might speedily take place, to unite them again in the fullness of privileged affection. Henry returned to what was now his only home, to watch over his young plantations and extend his improvements for her sake, to whose share in them he looked anxiously forward. Catherine remained at Fullerton to cry. Whether the torments of absence were softened by a clandestine correspondence, let us not inquire. Mr. and Mrs. Morland never did, and they had been too kind to exact any promise, and whenever Catherine received a letter, as at the time happened pretty often, they always looked another way. The anxiety which in this state of their attachment must be the portion of Henry and Catherine, and of all who loved either, as to its final event, can hardly extend, I fear, to the bosom of my readers, 
who will see in the telltale compression of the pages before them that we are all hastening together to perfect felicity. The means by which their early marriage was effected can be the only doubt. What probable circumstance would work upon a temper like the general's? The circumstance which chiefly availed was the marriage of his daughter with a man of fortune and consequence which took place in the course of the summer. An accession of dignity that threw him into a fit of good humour from which he did not recover till after Eleanor had obtained his forgiveness of Henry and his permission for him to be a fool if he liked it. The marriage of Eleanor Tilney, her removal from all the evils of such a home as Northanger had been made by Henry's banishment to the home of her choice and the man of her choice, is an event which I expect to give general satisfaction among all her acquaintance. My own joy on the occasion is very sincere. I know no one more entitled by unpretending merit or better prepared by habitual suffering to receive and enjoy felicity. Her partiality for this gentleman was not of recent origin, and he had been long withheld only by inferiority of situation from addressing her. His unexpected accession to title and fortune had removed all his difficulties, and never had the general loved his daughter so well in all her hours of companionship, utility, and patient endurance as when he first hailed her your ladyship. Her husband was really deserving of her, independent of his peerage, his wealth and his attachment, being to a precision the most charming young man in the world. Any further definition of his merits must be unnecessary. The most charming young man in the world is instantly before the imagination of us all. Concerning the one in question, therefore, I have only to add, aware that the rules of composition forbid the introduction of a character not connected with my fable, that this was the very gentleman whose negligent servant left behind him the collection of washing bills resulting from a long visit at Northanger by which my heroine was involved in one of her most alarming adventures. The influence of the Viscount and Viscountess on their brother's behalf was assisted by that right understanding of Mr Morland's circumstances which as soon as the general would allow himself to be informed they were qualified to give. It taught him that he had been scarcely more misled by Thorpe's first boast of the family wealth than by his subsequent malicious overthrow of it, that in no sense of the word were they necessitous or poor, and that Catherine would have three thousand pounds. This was so material an amendment of his late expectations that it greatly contributed to smooth the descent of his pride, and by no means without its effect was the private intelligence which he was at some pains to procure that the Fullerton estate, being entirely at the disposal of its present proprietor, was consequently open to every greedy speculation. On the strength of this, the general, soon after Eleanor's marriage, permitted his son to return to Northanger, and thence made him the bearer of his consent, very courteously worded in a page full of empty professions to Mr Morland. The event which it authorised soon followed. Henry and Catherine were married. The bells rang and everybody smiled, and as this took place within a twelve-month from the first day of their meeting, it will not appear, after all the dreadful delays occasioned by the general's cruelty, that they were essentially hurt by it. To begin perfect happiness at the respective ages of twenty-six and eighteen is to do pretty well, and professing myself, moreover, convinced that the general's unjust interference, so far from being really injurious to their felicity, was perhaps rather conducive to it by improving their knowledge of each other and adding strength to their attachment. I leave it to be settled by whomsoever it may concern whether the tendency of this work be altogether to recommend parental tyranny or reward filial disobedience. The End And they lived happily ever after. Okay, we knew it was going to end happily. That's great. There are some interesting things about that ending, however, that we will get to in a moment. Before we do, there were a couple of tidbits that I didn't want to share with you in advance because I didn't want to spoil anything. But I do want to go back and pick up a couple of things that were mentioned. One, Henry Tilney did not fall in love with Catherine at first sight. This is part of Northanger Abbey's anti-Gothic stance. 
in Gothic novels, obviously, and Romantic capital R novels, they both would have seen each other, fallen in love with each other, been swept off their feet with adoration, blah, blah, blah. Didn't happen. Henry really only started noticing Catherine because Catherine really seemed to be into him. And then over time, grew to appreciate her. And I have a voicemail for you a little bit later that talks about that. But they actually grew to care about each other for real over time. And especially over the amount of time where they were surreptitiously writing letters to each other, which I'll talk about a little bit more when we get there. I'm going through the chapters in order right now. As you do, there was one tricky piece of prose towards the beginning of chapter 30 that he engaged her faith before he mentioned the subject. Henry Tilney made sure that he wanted to marry her before he let her know what General Tilney's beef was, because he knew she's too, she's too good a person. If he had explained General Tilney's mental situation first, she would never have agreed to this. She would, she would never have agreed to marry him because that would have gone against his father's wishes and she's not that kind of person. And so he, he knew her well enough to know that he was, he was going to have to make sure that this was something she really did want before continuing the narrative with her. General Tilney presents an interesting problem within Jane Austen. She works very hard in all of her books to create real people with real problems, uh, real complicated people. Elizabeth Bennet being one of the, the most famous for her layers of complexity and her very real flaws, as well as her very real characteristics that we all, we bookish, we few, we happy few, we bookish people tend to admire an awful lot. Jane Austen did get criticized at the time. She had obviously passed away already, but when this book was published, but her book did get criticized at the time for General Tilney. He's a little too easy a villain and a little too implausible. For Thorpe to have convinced him of Catherine's situation and the Moreland's wealth, knowing how Thorpe spoke and how hyperbolic he could get, and the fact that the story would have kind of grown over time as he spoke to Tilney. And of course, you can understand Thorpe being Thorpe, he would have taken his already overblown tale that he seems to have really believed himself because he was trying to get his sister married to Catherine's brother. So Thorpe obviously believed it, but that, that doesn't mean he would have been refraining from adding to the lore while talking to General Tilney. We know from the way Thorpe spoke in front of us that it would have been weird for someone like General Tilney, who clearly has a head on his shoulders, to have bought everything that John was selling. And that is a little far-fetched and hard to swallow. However, it is certainly in keeping with a Gothic narrative. And so how everybody else, all of our non-Gothic characters, we have a villain in Thorpe, we have a villain, in air quotes, in General Tilney, and older son Tilney fits into the Byronic hero, capital R romantic, capital G gothic. He also fits into that mold. Outside of them, it's how everybody else responds to those situations that is the, the anti-gothic part, or the satirizing the gothic part of Northanger Abbey. One of the other complaints about General Tilney was that Never from the first moment when Catherine races into their drawing room to explain what happened with Isabella lying about their uh, going for a walk. From that moment on, Catherine never behaves like a great lady in front of General Tilney. And so he would have to have ignored all of that evidence, you know, just have been so dollar signs for eyeballs all the way along, including 
not having sent out some feelers himself, at least to find out while in Bath a little bit more about the Allens from somebody other than Thorpe, who, you know, he spoke to because I think they were in the gambling room or the, the card room, and that was the only place he knew Thorpe from. So, yeah, you kind of have to agree with the criticism. At the same time, who cares? Great story. However, the other place, and it's pr probably less forgivable, in trying to bring the novel to a reasonably lengthed close, Jane Austen had to have General Tilney send Catherine home rather precipitately. And that treatment truly was shocking at the time. And it, it needed to be. It needed to be a complete break. And it needed to cast no doubt on the fact that Henry and Catherine were not going to be a thing. We needed that to happen for the end of the book to be satisfying. There's no way that a gentleman would have done that. It's really, really hard to believe that. And in fact, this one part of the book was criticized by some of the Gothic authors uh, at the time, mostly and importantly, because word of that would have gotten around. Chan you know, nothing, nothing stays hidden forever. Chances are word of what Tilney had done to Catherine would have gotten around. And that breach of good behavior actually could have ruined, not ruined, but damaged his reputation amongst his friends, especially since he's taking his responsibility for his position in society rather seriously. And so that's a legitimate criticism. So Tilney and Thorpe really do become the most gothic of all of our characters. Well, Tilney doesn't exactly stay in that category. Interestingly enough, we never really hear any kind of concluding text on Thorpe and Isabella, which is odd. The Gothic novels definitely wrapped up all their loose ends. What you thought was a ghost turned out to be a curtain with a, a window pane, you know, in front of a window pane that had been broken and so air was coming in. Every single thing wound, winds up getting wrapped up at the end of these Gothic novels. Jane Austen did not do that for us. And I, I have a feeling that, one, it was to save time and not break the narrative, but also because we're trying to have a happy ending. And while it's fairly certain that Isabella and to a lesser extent, Thorpe, because he's a guy and he would have gotten away with it anyway. Isabella was not heading anywhere particularly positive for her. They did a, a nice job in the movie version of pretty clearly implying that Captain Tilney had his way with her. She, of course, foolishly thinking that they were going to get married. It's kind of hard not to think that that is, if not likely, was going to happen at some point with Isabella. She was not well governed by her own mind in that respect. However, one of Austin's points in writing stories like Northanger Abbey was to do what the Gothic novels couldn't do. The chances of any young woman at the time to have actually experienced anything remotely like the drama of these Gothic novels was nil. However, the chances of young women coming into contact with someone like Thorpe was very high. And in this respect, she really was able to give some kind of moral guidance to young women and young men on the very real dangers that might await them as they emerge out into society and start to have to learn how to adult. And, uh, and that's one of the beautiful things about Jane Austen. It's very similar to Anne Bronte and The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. The husband was a bit of a Byronic hero and a little over the top. However, we know from Anne Bronte's personal history and other writings of the time, he was far from the worst real life household tyrant of his, his ilk. He just happened to be one that was written and fictionalized in a Bronte book. And there's a little bit more about Henry and Catherine. Early on, 
it feels very lopsided, their relationship. To me, it, it felt rather lopsided. Like Henry was definitely the older and wiser, and Catherine was the younger and not just more innocent, but more naive and perhaps not quite as bright. However, they're in an interesting juxtaposition as we come to the end of the novel because Catherine's family has behaved so beautifully in the face of the situation. And General Tilney has been so appalling that there is a familial equilibrium that is set. Both Henry and Catherine themselves behave well. Just because the Morelands don't have as much money as the Tilneys, however, has not harmed their standing as far as the viewer of this story goes. They are, money aside, better people. And that would not be lost on someone like Henry. And it also shouldn't be lost on us that for Henry to actively go against his father's wishes is a heroic stance. In a, a simple story like this, something that is not overwrought and swashbuckling, what Henry does, this, this quiet, dignified refusal to follow bad advice given by his father, especially when his father is who General Tilney is, is really quite admirable. And it just, it just makes me like Henry all that much more. Now, one of the places where Jane really does kind of trip over the gothic novel trope is in the very, very last chapter, almost sort of introducing a completely new character. In the movie version, they avoided this problem by sort of introducing Eleanor's love interest earlier. Here he is kind of a deus ex machina. He sweeps in. He's the god from the machine who flies in to save the day. Jane ties this back to the earlier part of the narrative by having his servant be the one who left the laundry bills in the chest. That is ridiculous and goofy and funny and just fine because we know that Eleanor is with the person that she wanted to be with. And that's great. And the slightly more complicated problem that Jane Austen kind of talks around is that he must have been the second son and not going to inherit the title or the estate, the fortune, if his older brother had passed away or something like that, then the second son would have become the heir. And that must have been what happened in order for Eleanor to make this felicitous alliance, allowing her to have a happy ending as well, which God knows she deserved. There was an oblique reference to the Fullerton estate, the Allens's estate, having no entailment on it. This is General Tilney does finally check up, finds out that the Allens, who don't have any children, who very well might leave something to the Moreland children, or perhaps to Catherine, their favorite, since there's no entailment on it, it means that there's no legal path that the property ownership has to follow, which means there is every chance that the property should it come to Catherine, would be unencumbered by previous decisions made by previous generations and would be available to be used as or added to the larger Tilney estate. So that's where General Tilney was going with that. Jane Austen also, because by the time she finishes the book, she is no longer 17 years old, she does end it interestingly with the parental tyranny of General Tilney, forcing the two young lovers to take their time and write each other these surreptitious letters. They shouldn't have been corresponding with each other uh, directly, female to male, unmarried people, without an announced engagement. However, we know that the Morelands have decided to look the other way. When letters came to Catherine, we assume that Henry had worked out something with Catherine so that her letters could be delivered to him without arousing suspicion from General Tilney, or she sent them to his 
parsonage. But either way, even though the entire story took under a year, Henry and Catherine spent the bulk of it only being able to correspond, not seeing each other. And they learned a lot about each other that way. And in a, a Barrett Browning fashion, found that they really were a good match for each other. So if General Tilney hadn't been such a punk, that wouldn't have happened. And that might have made their happy ending uh, more troublesome or challenging to maintain after the wedding. So she, she leaves that question to the dear reader at the end, whether it is to recommend parental tyranny, General Tilney's keeping them apart long enough that they could get to know each other better, or to reward filial disobedience, the fact that they were disobeying their parents in considering, or at least their parent, in considering the match at all and writing back and forth to each other. So it's a sweet end to a sweet book with some truly sweet people in it. And, and how lovely. So I have one voicemail to play for you from Jana Lee, and then I have a surprise. So here we go with Jana Lee. Hi, Heather. This is Jana Lee, and it's my Hikes and Ravelry. I just finished five episode 560, so I finished 559 and 560, right? 559 was right up my alley. I loved, I loved that chapter, or that section of um, the book. I had a couple of comments on that one. Um, I think my favorite line out of that was when Henry was speaking to Catherine, and he says, your mind is warped by an innate principle of general integrity, because she's expecting people to act honestly, both his father and Isabella, and I find it hilarious that he sees that, and he comments on it, but he's not commenting like, oh, you're so naive, wait until you've grown up. He's saying, your mind is warped by an innate principle of general integrity. You're not going to understand these people because you are better than they are. And I find that hilarious. I think it's awesome that he, that both that he values that about her, but also that he's teasing her about it a little bit. Um, I also love that still Catherine is so surprised by the general's behavior that, oh, no, anything will do for dinner. It's just fine. Don't put yourself out. We'll just come whenever. And, you know, and then he rearranges everybody's days so that he can come on Wednesday because that's the only day that will work for him. But then Henry heads out two days early to scare his housekeeper into preparing a proper meal. And Catherine is so surprised that he has to leave. But but your father just said he didn't mind if, you know, he didn't want you to put yourself out. I'm sure he'd be okay with it. And Henry just smiles at her, just smiles at her because he knows better. But he also, it just, he just really enjoys that, that she is so honest and straightforward. Um, I also had to comment that Amelia Peabody, Those Mysteries, and Elizabeth Peters as an author, I found her and fell in love, fell in love with those books. I have not read any of, or have not listened to any of them on audiobooks. I'll have to try them. But as far as the books go, they just, they bring a lot of delight to my life. I really have enjoyed them. Um, the second thing that I wanted to touch on was in episode 560, Catherine's Return Home. Um, <clears throat> it strikes me as both amusing and it explains a lot about Catherine and, and her reactions to both that she can indulge herself in the um, love of Gothic novels, but also that when she's actually put into that position herself, she doesn't react like a, a heroine would. She reacts like a normal person and she, she stays up late and she packs and she's not focused on the weather or, you know, on how difficult the trip is. She just makes the next step and finds people to help her along the way and gets herself home all right. But I love that her parents and family, while they're upset at her treatment, they don't assume that it's her fault. I think that's awesome. And I also think that my favorite part was when her mother was speaking to the younger sister, Sarah, about it and said, you know, not to not to spend time worrying about it. But she says, the mom says that the reason for General Tilney's bad, Tilney's bad behavior is something not at all worth understanding. I think that dismissal would bother him. I think it would stay with him much longer than his bad behavior towards his guest to stay with Catherine and her family. And I feel like that's kind of the best revenge that they forgive and they forget about it 
and he's probably still stuck on the, I would never behave like this. I'm a proper person. We don't know the, the like the reasoning behind it, but I just I feel like being as how it's general to me is probably not something that. Anyway, well, we'll see. We'll see in the last chapter. But it, it does speak highly of the family's good sense, and it really um, kind of just brings home, like, the, the good background that Catherine has been given, like, her parents and her family and the neighborhood that she's grown up in. They see stuff, and they can comment on it being, oh, this, you know, this is really bad. I'm so glad that you made it home. Let's not worry about that anymore. Yes, General Tilney behaved very badly, but, you know, it's something not at all worth understanding. We're not going to waste our time on it. We're not going to waste our energy on it. I, I just, that, anyway, I love her mom. It's great. I am so happy that people have seemed to like this book so much. <laughs> I really did too. It's, it's been a lot of fun. It was a nice palate cleanser after The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. And as I make my final choice for the next book we're going to do. I told you it was going to be a mystery. I am holding to that. But I am also able to tell you that the next book, it'll be an American author. And we have back for us the fabulous Kim Zucker to read for the next book. I don't have the title of the book for you yet. I am having a hard time deciding amongst I think it's three. Th I've narrowed it down to three. And so I'm going to take the next couple of weeks to work on that, figure out which one I'm going to do, get the book to Kim, and figure mid August is when I will be back with our next book. In the meantime, my surprise to you is this I went on to LibriVox and found one audio recording of Jane Austen's History of England. You will remember that Catherine and Henry, one of their conversations early on was about histories, and Catherine was very critical of them because they seemed to all be dates and men doing manly things, and the historians never seemed to <sighs> write about anyone except the people that they liked, and the villains couldn't possibly have been that villainous. And all of this goes back to Jane Austen wrote her own history of England, I believe when she was 15. And it is very silly and a lot of fun. And the girl who does the reading does a lovely job. So I am going to play you out with the history of England by Jane Austen. So until August, be well, take care of yourself, take care of each other, wear a mask, get a vaccine if you can. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. The History of England From the Reign of Henry IV to the Death of Charles I by a partial, prejudiced, and ignorant historian. To Miss Austen, eldest daughter of the Reverend George Austen, this work is inscribed with all due respect by the author. N.B. There will be very few dates in this history. The History of England Henry IV Henry IV ascended the throne of England, much to his own satisfaction, in the year 1399, after having prevailed on his cousin and predecessor, Richard II, to resign it to him and to retire for the rest of his life to Pomfret Castle, where he happened to be murdered. It is to be supposed that Henry was married, since he had certainly four sons, but it is not in my power to inform the reader who was his wife. Be this as it may, he did not live forever, but falling ill, his son, the Prince of Wales, came and took away the crown, whereupon the king made a long speech, for which I must refer the reader to Shakespeare's plays, and the prince made a still longer. Things being thus settled between them, the king died, and was succeeded by his son Henry, who had previously beat Sir William Gascon. Henry V this prince, after he succeeded to the throne, grew quite reformed and amiable, forsaking all his dissipated companions and never thrashing Sir William again. During his reign, Lord Cobham was burnt alive, but I forget what for. His majesty then turned his thoughts to France, where he went and fought the famous Battle of Agoncourt. He afterwards married the king's daughter Catherine, 
a very agreeable woman by Shakespeare's account. In spite of all this, however, he died, and was succeeded by his son, Henry. Henry the Sixth. I cannot say much for this monarch's sense, nor would I if I could, for he was a Lancastrian. I suppose you know all about the wars between him and the Duke of York, who was of the right side. If you do not, you had better read some other history, for I shall not be very diffuse in this, meaning by it only to vent my spleen against, and show my hatred to all those people whose parties or principles do not suit with mine, and not to give information. This king married Margaret of Anjou, a woman whose distresses and misfortunes were so great as almost to make me who hate her pity her. It was in this reign that Joan of Arc lived and made such a row among the English. They should not have burnt her, but they did. There were several battles between the Yorkists and Lancastrians, in which the former, as they ought, usually conquered. At length they were entirely overcome. The king was murdered, the queen was sent home, and Edward IV ascended the throne. Edward IV This monarch was famous only for his beauty and his courage, of which the picture we have here given of him and his undaunted behavior in marrying one woman while he was engaged to another are sufficient proofs. His wife was Elizabeth Woodville, a widow who, poor woman, was afterwards confined in a convent by that monster of iniquity and avarice, Henry the Seventh. One of Edward's mistresses was Jane Shore, who has had a play written about her, but it is a tragedy and therefore not worth reading. Having performed all these noble actions, his majesty died, and was succeeded by his son. Edward V. This unfortunate prince lived so little a while that nobody had time to draw his picture. He was murdered by his uncle's contrivance, whose name was Richard III. Richard III. The character of this prince has been in general very severely treated by historians. But as he was a York, I am rather inclined to suppose him a very respectable man. It has indeed been confidently asserted that he killed his two nephews and his wife, but it has also been declared that he did not kill his two nephews, which I am inclined to believe true. And if this is the case, it may also be affirmed that he did not kill his wife. For if Perkin Warbeck was really the Duke of York, why not Lambert Simnel be the widow of Richard? Whether innocent or guilty, he did not reign long in peace, for Henry Tudor, Earl of Richmond, as great a villain as ever lived, made a great fuss about getting the crown, and having killed the king at the Battle of Bosworth, he succeeded to it. Henry the Seventh. This monarch, soon after his ascension, married the Princess Elizabeth of York, by which alliance he plainly proved that he thought his own right inferior to hers, though he pretended to the contrary. By this marriage he had two sons and two daughters the elder of which daughters was married to the king of Scotland, and had the happiness of being grandmother to one of the first characters of the world, but of her I shall have occasion to speak more at large in future. The youngest, Mary, married first the king of France, and secondly the duke of Suffolk, by whom she had one daughter, afterwards the mother of Lady Jane Grey, who, though inferior to her lovely cousin, the queen of Scots, was yet an amiable young woman, and famous for reading Greek, while other people were hunting. It was in the reign of Henry the Seventh that Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel, before mentioned, made their appearance, the former of whom was set in the stocks, took shelter in Benlieu Abbey, and was beheaded with the Earl of Warwick, and the latter was taken into the king's kitchen. His majesty died, and was succeeded by his son Henry, whose only merit was his not being quite so bad as his daughter Elizabeth. Henry the Eighth. It would be an affront to my readers, were I to suppose that they were not as well acquainted with the particulars of this king's reign as I am myself. I will therefore save them the task of reading again what they have read before, and myself the trouble of writing what I do not perfectly recollect, by giving only a slight sketch of the principal events which marked his reign. Among these may be ranked Cardinal Wolseley's telling the farther abbot of Leicester Abbey that he was come to lay his bones among them, the reformation in religion, and the king's riding through the streets of London with Anne Boleyn. It is, however, but justice and my duty to declare that this amiable woman was entirely innocent of the crimes with which she was accused, and of which her beauty, her elegance, and her sprightliness were sufficient proofs, not to mention her solemn protestations of innocence, the weakness of the charges against her, 
and the king's character, all of which add some confirmation, though perhaps but slight ones when in comparison with those before alleged in her favor. Though I do not profess giving many dates, yet as I think it proper to give some, and shall of course make the choice of those which it is most necessary for the reader to know, I think it right to inform him that her letter to the king was dated the 6th of May. The crimes and cruelties of this prince were too numerous to be mentioned, as this history I trust has fully shown, and nothing can be said in his vindication but that his abolishing religious houses and leaving them to the ruinous depredations of time has been of infinite use to the landscape of England in general, which probably was a principal motive for his doing it, since otherwise, why should a man who was of no religion himself be at so much trouble to abolish one which had for ages been established in the kingdom? His Majesty's fifth wife was the Duke of Norfolk's niece, who, though universally acquitted of the crimes for which she was beheaded, has been by many people supposed to have led an abandoned life before her marriage. Of this, however, I have many doubts, since she was a relation of that noble Duke of Norfolk, who was so warm in the Queen of Scotland's cause, and who at last fell a victim to it. The king's last wife contrived to survive him, but with difficulty effected it. He was succeeded by his only son, Edward. Edward the Sixth. As this prince was only nine years old at the time of his father's death, he was considered by many people as too young to govern, and the late king happening to be of the same opinion, his mother's brother, the Duke of Somerset, was chosen protector of the realm during his minority. This man, on the whole, was a very amiable character, and is somewhat of a favorite with me, though I would by no means pretend to affirm that he was equal to those first of men, Robert, Earl of Essex, Delmere, or Gilpin. He was beheaded, of which he might with reason have been proud, had he known that such was the death of Mary Queen of Scotland. But as it was impossible that he should be conscious of what had never happened, it does not appear that he felt particularly delighted with the manner of it. After his decease, the Duke of Northumberland had the care of the king in the kingdom, and performed his trust of both so well that the king died, and the kingdom was left to his daughter-in-law, the Lady Jane Grey, who has already been mentioned as reading Greek. Whether she really understood that language, or whether such a study proceeded only from an excess of vanity, for which I believe she was always rather remarkable, is uncertain. Whatever might be the cause, she preserved in the same appearance of knowledge and contempt of what was generally esteemed to be pleasure during the whole of her life, for she declared herself displeased with being appointed queen, and while conducting to the scaffold, she wrote a sentence in Latin, and another in Greek, on seeing the dead body of her husband accidentally passing that way. Mary. This woman had the good luck of being advanced to the throne of England, in spite of the superior pretensions, merit, and beauty of her cousins Mary Queen of Scotland and Jane Grey. Nor can I pity the kingdom for the misfortunes they experienced during her reign, since they fully deserved them, for having allowed her to succeed her brother, which was a double piece of folly, since they might have foreseen that as she died without children, she would be succeeded by that disgrace to humanity, that pest to society, Elizabeth. Many were the people who fell martyrs to the Protestant religion during her reign, I suppose not fewer than a dozen. She married Philip King of Spain, who in her sister's reign was famous for building armadas. She died without issue, and then the dreadful moment came, in which the destroyer of all comfort, the deceitful betrayer of trust reposed in her, and the murderess of her cousin succeeded to the throne. Elizabeth It was the peculiar misfortune of this woman to have bad ministers, since wicked as she herself was, she could not have committed such extensive mischief had not these vile and abandoned men connived at and encouraged her in her crimes. I know that it has by many people been asserted and believed that Lord Burley, Sir Francis Walshingham, and the rest who filled the chief offices of state were deserving, experienced, and able minister. But, oh, how blinded such writers and such readers must be to true merit, to merit despised, neglected, and defamed, if they can persist in such opinions when they reflect that these men, these boasted men, were such scandals to their country and their sex as to allow and assist their queen in confining for the space of nineteen years a woman 
who, if the claims of relationship and merit were of no avail, yet as a queen, and as one who condescended to place confidence in her, had every reason to expect assistance and protection, and at length in allowing Elizabeth to bring this amiable woman to an untimely, unmerited, and scandalous death. Can any one, if he reflects, but for a moment on this blot, this everlasting blot upon their understanding and their character, allow any praise to Lord Burley or Sir Francis Walshingham? Oh, what must this bewitching princess, whose only friend was the Duke of Norfolk, and whose only ones now, Mr. Whittaker, Mrs. Leffery, Mrs. Knight, and myself, who was abandoned by her son, confined by her cousin, abused, reproached, and vilified by all, what must her most noble mind have suffered when informed that Elizabeth had given orders for her death? Yet she bore it with the most unshaken fortitude, firm in her mind, constant in her religion, and prepared herself to meet the cruel fate to which she was doomed with a magnanimity that would alone proceed from conscious innocence. And yet, could you, reader, have believed it possible that some hardened and zealous Protestants have even abused her for that steadfastness in Catholic religion which reflected on her so much credit? But this is a striking proof of their narrow souls and prejudiced judgments who accuse her. She was executed in the great hall at Forthingay Castle, sacred place, on Wednesday, the 8th of February, 1586, to the everlasting reproach of Elizabeth, her ministers, and of England in general. It may not be unnecessary, before I entirely conclude my account of this ill-fitted queen, to observe that she had been accused of several crimes during the time of her reigning in Scotland, of which I now most seriously do assure my reader that she was entirely innocent, having never been guilty of anything more than imprudencies into which she was betrayed by the openness of her heart, her youth, and her education. Having, I trust, by this assurance, entirely done away with every suspicion and every doubt which might have arisen in the reader's mind, from what other historians have written of her, I shall proceed to mention the remaining events that marked Elizabeth's reign. It was about this time that Sir Francis Drake, the first English navigator who sailed around the world, lived to be the ornament of his country and his profession. Yet great as he was, and justly celebrated as a sailor, I cannot help foreseeing that he will be equaled in this or the next century by one who, though now but young, already promises to answer all the ardent and sanguine expectations of his relations and friends, amongst whom I may class the amiable lady to whom this work is dedicated, and my no less amiable self. Though of a different profession, and shining in a different sphere of life, yet equally conspicuous in the character of an earl, as Drake was in that of a sailor, was Robert Devereux, Lord of Essex. This unfortunate young man was not unlike in character to that equally unfortunate one, Frederick Delmer. The simile may be carried still farther, and Elizabeth, the torment of Essex, may be compared to Emmeline of Delmer. It would be endless to recount the misfortunes of this noble and gallant earl. It is sufficient to say that he was beheaded on the 25th of February, after having been Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, after having clapped his hand on his sword, and after performing many other services to his country. Elizabeth did not long survive his loss, and died so miserable that were it not an injury to the memory of Mary, I should pity her. James I. Though this king had some faults, among which, and as the most principal, was his allowing his mother's death, yet considered on the whole, I cannot help liking him. He married Anne of Denmark, and had several children. Fortunately for him, his eldest son, Prince Henry, died before his father, or he might have experienced the evils which befell his unfortunate brother. As I am myself partial to the Roman Catholic religion, it is with infinite regret that I am obliged to blame the behavior of any member of it. Yet truth being, I think, very excusable in a historian, I am necessitated to say that in this reign the Roman Catholics of England did not behave like gentlemen to the Protestants. Their behavior, indeed, to the royal family and both houses of Parliament might justly be considered by them as very uncivil, 
and even Sir Henry Percy, though certainly the best-bred man of the party, had none of that general politeness which is so universally pleasing, as his attentions were entirely confined to Lord Monteagle. Sir Walter Raleigh flourished in this and the preceding reign, and is by many people held in great veneration and respect. But as he was an enemy of the noble Essex, I have nothing to say in praise of him, and must refer all those who may wish to be acquainted with the particulars of his life to Mr. Sheridan's play of the critic, where they will find many interesting anecdotes of him, as well as of his friend, Sir Christopher Hatton. His majesty was of that amiable disposition which inclines to friendship, and in such points was possessed of a keener penetration in discovering merit than many other people. I once heard an excellent charade on a carpet, of which the subject I am now on reminds me, and as I think it may afford my reader some amusement to find it out, I shall here take the liberty of presenting it to them. Charade My first is what my second was to King James I, and you tread upon my hull. The principal favourites of His Majesty were Carr, who was afterwards created Earl of Somerset, and whose name perhaps may have some share in the above-mentioned charade, and George Villiers, afterward Duke of Buckingham. On His Majesty's death he was succeeded by his son Charles. Charles I. This amiable monarch seems born to have suffered misfortunes equal to those of his lovely grandmother, misfortunes which he could not deserve since he was her descendant. Never certainly were there before so many detestable characters at one time in England as in this period of its history. Never were amiable men so scarce, the number of them throughout the whole kingdom accounting to only five, besides the inhabitants of Oxford, who were always loyal to their king and faithful to his interests. The names of this noble five, who never forgot the duty of the subject, or swerved from their attachment to his majesty, were as follows. The king himself, ever steadfast in his own support, Archbishop Laud, Earl of Stratford, Vicomte Falkland, and Duke of Ormond, who were scarcely less strenuous or zealous in the cause. While the villains of this time would make too long a list to be written or read, I shall therefore content myself with mentioning the leaders of the gang. Cromwell, Fairfax, Hampton, and Pym may be considered as the original causers of distresses and civil wars in which England for many years was embroiled. In this reign, as well as in that of Elizabeth, I am obliged, in spite of my attachment to the Scotch, to consider them as equally guilty with the generality of the English, since they dared to think differently from their sovereign, to forget the adoration which as stewards it was their duty to pay them, to rebel against, dethrone, and imprison the unfortunate Mary, to oppose, to deceive, and to sell the no less unfortunate Charles. The events of this monarch's reign are too numerous for my pen, and indeed the recital of any events, except what I make myself, is uninteresting to me. My principal reason for undertaking the history of England being to prove the innocence of the Queen of Scotland, which I flatter myself with having effectually done, and to abuse Elizabeth, though I am rather fearful of having fallen short in the latter part of my scheme. As therefore it is not my intention to give any particular account of the distresses into which this king was involved, through the misconduct and cruelty of his parliament, I shall satisfy myself with vindicating him from the reproach of arbitrary and tyrannical government with which he has often been charged. This, I feel, is not difficult to be done, for with one argument I am certain of satisfying every sensible and well-disposed person whose opinions have been properly guided by a good education. And this argument is that he was a steward. Finney, Saturday, November 26th, 1791. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff.
And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.